Hey, this is Sage from Sage Outcast, and I've been in the logistics and trucking field for over 20 years. And for 12 of those 20 years, I've been dealing with the same factoring company. It's a great factoring company, and they've given me the opportunity to give you guys a fantastic factoring deal. It's with a factoring company that is both established with a bank and traded on the stock market, so you don't have to worry about them going under. Also, it's a factoring company that will give you a fantastic rate on your carrier and brokerage. So when it's time to grow your company to that next level, don't go with a factoring company that won't give you an opportunity to bring your brokerage on also. Go ahead and shoot me an email with your contact information, and I'll go ahead and reach out and hook you up with one of the best factoring companies out there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special Saturday show. I'm not usually here on the weekends, but uh, I actually might be here tonight as well because the wife got called into work, so I might be working a little bit extra tonight. Uh, anyways, ladies and gentlemen, uh, here we are. This is a special show. Uh, it's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse, but I got an opportunity to sit down with an old friend, and uh, he presented me this uh, work he's been working on, and uh, it's pretty fascinating. So, uh, we're going to, we're going to go ahead and lay some of it out here. And, uh, this is some pretty fascinating stuff. I want to go ahead and bring on, uh, my old friend here, Sage, how you doing, brother? Hey, how's it going? Living up to my outcast name pretty much. That's what, that's what I've been doing, but I want to thank you for having me on. Like I said, I, I appreciate you coming on for a Saturday also, which is not normally your, your day of work. Um, but as you're going to be probably going live later on, I don't feel so bad no more. Yeah, dude, it's still a day of work. I just don't do anything on the podcast. I got, um, I'm writing, I'm, I'm now like elbow deep. I was going to say another word, elbow deep into uh, part three of my Fulton County or my, my Georgia expose. And uh, I'm going to get that out on Monday morning. Uh, a lot of work to be done on that. But uh, yeah, here we are. Uh, we were talking a couple days ago or a few days ago and we were going through and yeah, somebody was saying you have just a slight echo, uh, Sage. Do I? Um, Okay. But we were going through some of these findings that you have, and this ties back to MH370. And when you told me this about, you know, the, the ties to MH370, I was like, whoa, that's really weird because we just had this report come out about MH370 possibly just disappearing out of the sky, which is incredibly bizarre. Um, I haven't gotten too into that. Red Pill 78, Zach Payne has gotten into that. Uh, if you want to check out his podcast over on Rumble, he gets pretty, uh, he gets pretty you know, in depth on that. It's, it's bizarre as hell. But so when you, when you brought that up to me, Sage, I was like, all right, I definitely got to listen to this. I was doing a lot of traveling. So it took me a little bit to get in, in touch with you, but here we are, man. Yeah. So I, uh, let's I, go. So when I, I reached out for two reasons, one, I reached out cause I need a little bit of information that you had in regards to the vid. Um, and some of the dates that, that you had with, with the money that was transferred and things like that. And then when I, I got that from you, I, of course, you said, what, what are you working on? And I said, well, 
actually something that scares the hell out of me. Um, I basically ran it past you to say, okay, this is what I've got. This is my, my, my mess, and hear me out with it. So it, it kind of starts, uh, you know what? I, I do have a little echo. That's on my side, but that's uh, on purpose. I'm sorry. I, it's adjusted to my um, roadcaster. It's because on my show, I have a little echo on my show. So if they hear oh. that, that's actually on mine. So sorry. Um, I forgot to turn it off. Anyways, so what I, the way I am basically want to start this is, is like this. Uh, I'm going to be doing a, a documentary film on it and putting it all together, but I, I'm kind of, this is the outline of it from here. If I were to ask you, if I were to basically give you a riddle, do, I can take down all, almost all of New York City without even touching it or the people in it, where the people would become, you know, clueless and obsolete, and basically everything in New York City would be destroyed. How can I, how could I do that? And from there, I kind of want to explain what I believe World War III is going to be over. And it's going to be over something we, we all know or we all have in our house is basically the silicon semiconductor chip. Okay. So first I want to kind of go into um, how, why and how that kind of works. So I'll, I'll speed it up a little bit because I know which way I'm going to go with this. So if you were to look at New York City and everybody that's in New York City, it's a financial district. It's a data collection district. Most of the stuff that's being there is not manufacturing or, or things like that. It's data collection, data entry, you know, things, all that type of nature. If you were to take every, just one skyscraper with all the people in it and smash it all the way to the ground and make it completely flat, that would be a silicon semiconductor. The people inside are nothing more than ones and zeros. Okay? So everything that's in New York City could basically be flattened down and put onto a processor of a computer with semiconductors. And this is called Industry 4.0. Originally, you had Industry 3.0, which was steel and manufacturing, and, and the United States grew and exploded in growth. Because of World War II, places had to be rebuilt. You know, everybody was getting bombed. We weren't. We had the steel. We put that together. Well, Industry 4.0 is the movement from the, that industrial revolution to a technology revolution of semiconductors. So one of the things that makes this work is something called a quantum computer. And a quantum computer works on such a speed level, it's, it's hard to grasp. It's unfathomable. Unfathomable. So what you do, if you were to con consider all of the people in a skyscraper, bits, a quantum computer has qubits, and it works on quantum mechanics and um, quantum entanglement and things like that. So... 16,000 people working inside one skyscraper would be a normal computer. A quantum computer, it only needs 10 people to do the same work as 16,000 people. So the more, and obviously a computer has way more bits than 16,000. So as you add more and more qubits to a computer, it's unfathomable the amount of speeds it can go. Now, it's not going to help you when, with, when it comes to streaming and watching YouTube and stuff like that, but what it can break down is algorithms and data entry, and it can break codes, it can break encryption, it can break all of this. Right. So these computers got to a point that the government even told people, and I'm going to go over this, to stop making them because it's, we don't know how to protect this, in, this intellectual property, we don't know where to go from this. But I showed Can kind of video that we're, our entire lives are nothing more than algorithms to, everybody, to Google and everybody else. They literally can predict absolutely everything that we are doing and what we're going to do. Uh, and to the point that Target knows that your, uh, a guy's 15-year-old daughter was pregnant before he knew his 15-year-old daughter was pregnant, not, not just by what she was looking at, but just by other things that she was going through that they targeted her because of all this other stuff um, in regards to her family life and everything else. 
So, so hold on, let me let me stop you there for a second. What is the difference between a quantum computer and artificial intelligence? So the quantum computer is what holds artificial intelligence. It's what allows artificial intelligence to to learn in split seconds what might right. take a week, right? And so artificial intelligence is 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 machine learning, um, and the machine learning is basically using our algorithms to to figure out exactly what we were going to do by able to saying yes or no. Uh, perfect example is uh, shorts. Shorts on YouTube or TikTok, the shorter the better, they want it because if you hit like, they start to learn what you like. That shorts and, and TikTok is nothing more than studying our algorithms and our emotional responses to some type of video so that the um, AI can machine learn our every emotion, right? So the quantum computers can do algorithms and become machine learning so fast that we would not be able to keep up. And now, this is both good or bad. Obviously, if this is used for good, which governments don't like using that stuff for good, it's fine. Well, they think they are. They, they think, think they, they are. But this is also stuff when it comes to perfect example. This could be used in a split second to judge if you, sh if, let's we say we go to central bank digital currency. This quantum computer can judge in a split second if they should allow you to make that purchase of that ground beef. Yep. Or if you're past your, you know, it, it's instantaneous rather than a computer that might, processing, processing, right? Sometimes we get little spinnings. Quantum computing is so fast, instead of your computer warming up, it would turn on like a light switch. It would just be on off from a, de from a completely off state on off. So... These quantum computers is the next generation uh, generation of processing information through uh, everything from us to military aspects. Being able to figure out exactly how to win the chess game of war through this quantum computer, through being able to process all this information. That's how dangerous these AI is when you mix split-second computing with it compared to, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so now you kind of understand the quantum computers and, and, how, and, and that, and I'll go into, like I said, in my documentary, I'll break it down a little bit more with video and stuff like that. All right, well, hold on, before you move on, I got right. questions. Uh, first and foremost, did you watch that movie I told you to watch? Which one? Heart of Stone. I did not yet. Okay, you gotta watch that, because it'll blow your mind, because, you know, like I said, it's a, it's based on a quantum computer that's 85,000 feet above the sky, floats around, relaying data down to like an ultra uber uh, globalist CIA type operation. And uh, they basically have like a Neuralink type uh, access to the machine. And the machine is able to guide them in real time on a mission and tell them in real time the... Uh, potential success rates and everything else of doing certain actions. Yes. 100%. So it's, it's, it's exactly what you're saying right there. And I know it's just Hollywood and Gal Gadot is in it and she's very easy on the eyes. So it's a, it's enjoyable watching uh, her for two and a half hours, but, okay. uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, she's one of my favorites, man. I absolutely love Gal Gadot. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fascinating how you get to that point with, with AI. And, um, you know, like I've been, I, I've been reading a lot on AI between, uh, general Flynn and Boone Cutler's book, uh, session two of five GW mm -hmm. and, um, also Mogadot scary, smart listening to a lot of podcasts and AI and, uh, Sage is actually underselling the capabilities of artificial intelligence. Yes. Um, I've had a lot of people and I, I just want to address this real quick. Cause I, I have people talk, tell me this all the time. And people will say, well, AI just looks at algorithms, so it's never really smarter than we as people. It'll never be smarter than us. But here's the problem. If I could take all the knowledge of every single person in the United States, compile it and mm -hmm. analyze it in, in a microsecond, I will be smarter than anybody in this planet Correct. by a landslide. By a land, it, Like, it's not even close. Yeah. And I mean, we're at the point now, and that's the AI, it's the machine learning aspect of AI. It's the, all right, so AI is the, is the, the brain, but the machine learning is the capability that is endless. So right. if you were to say to yourself, well, you know, I'm 47 years old, right? I've been learning for a, a long time. But a AI can machine learning computer can learn 24-7, 365 forever. Forever. 
to the point that machine learning, I mean, I didn't, want, didn't know how far you want me to dive into this, but they have, the, robots have been programmed that they are now cheating to win. They are now cheating to win. Uh, there was yeah. just something that came out that basically the computer said, hey, hit these targets, and you'll, that's good. It hit these targets. Uh, the controller basically said, don't hit these targets. And it said, okay, fine. And then eventually it got to the point that the computer basically wanted to hit targets, and it actually figured out it should take out its controller. Now this was a, a program. It should take out the controller so it can continue to hit targets. Um, some of these machines have basically learned to talk to each other in a language we, that we can't understand just so it could basically not allow us to understand. And they started to teach each other a language of their own. And this is what the computers and things are now doing through machine learning. So it is hugely important for whoever gets this technology first. One, it's, it's important to try to control this technology, but I think we're past the point. I'm not going to lie. Um, now, real, real quick, just to what you were saying right there about the targets and everything, that was actually a United States Air Force demonstration. Right. So that was the U.S. DOD Department of Defense. And I think the major that was in charge of it came out and made those statements and said this is what happened and everything. And then a couple weeks later, a couple days later, whatever, he came out and said, well, you know, that didn't actually happen. It was all theoretical. Correct. That was our theoretical. And, and it's, it's ironic that he came out several days later and said it that way. As if somebody told him, like, you weren't supposed to disclose that, you know, like, you got to retract that. Right. And then to the other thing you were talking about right there about the machines talking to himself, they had two uh, AI bots that had a, a, a goal to accomplish and they had to talk amongst themselves. I think they were trading. Correct. I think they were trading yep. something back and forth. And it started out great. Like, hey, if you have 20 apples, I have five bananas. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one banana for two apples. And, you know, they're going back and forth. And then. They started to develop this way of talking to themselves that when you look at the output, it makes no sense to us, but right. they understood everything that was being said. And so, you know, that's incredibly scary. You know, uh, Sage, just real quick, the book I'm reading, Scary Smart, the, the writer of that book was all hopes and, and, and hopium on AI and its potential in the future. But he always says, and, I, and I've, I've said this a lot on my podcast, he said the, the downfall for AI was when we taught AI to begin to code itself and be able to update itself without right. human input. And uh, when it got to that point, that's when you start seeing like things like this, where uh, you look at um, the game go, the old strategy game go, yep, with the, yep. and uh, it took a machine four hours of learning to be able to beat the world go master. And he beat him a thousand, uh, I think like a hundred times to zero. Right. So then, then they took another AI programmed it to battle the first AI, you know, updated it. Mm -hmm. And within nine minutes, it was able to beat the first AI a thousand to zero. And then it, they took it a step further. And I think it learned within like seconds, it Correct. taught itself within seconds how to beat the second AI. So it is a, uh, an exponential cycle, the increase in, in potential from artificial intelligence. I, I, I've said this many times, folks, and I don't want to scare you guys, but AI is a uh, an existence level threat. Yeah, and, and understand once we once that AI beat China, China then took billions of dollars, billions, and tr and starting to throw trillions eventually into AI. They saw the importance of that. That was the changing moment for for China that a that losing that game of Go, which is their game, our, sort of like our chess game, but it's their game of of and losing that. And you have to understand that the the biggest aspect too is. You are now becoming, civilizations are, are sometimes categorized by the fact of the language in which they speak, right? Like uh, uh, Korea was a part of China. I know I'm getting off a little bit, but Korea was basically controlled by China. And it wasn't until a lot of people, they didn't have the Korean language yet. And it wasn't until one of their kings came in and said, look, we need to make our own language so we can be separate from China. Creating your own la language separates you from all from other society, you know, from other cultures. So the fact that they are now creating their own language and and being able to communicate with each other is the first step basically separating themselves from the human species or Americans or whoever's creating them to create their own language. That's a big deal. And that's that's kind of where this is going and it's this is why it's it utterly it dangerous to be out there, right? And and whoever's controlling and whoever's working on it.
All right, so, so now that we got the foundation laid, let's dive yeah, into Yeah, so here's what I started to do. So I started to see the, the, the Malaysia 370, and I started to look at the aspects of things. So First, I didn't... Hold on, hold on, hold on. First, I, I'm sorry to keep interrupting you here, man. You got to give an overview of what MH370 is, because not everybody knows what... Okay, what well, is. I was just going to do that. So, so I, I was looking into the MH... So when I looked at it, I said, okay, let's take a look at this. So MH370 was a flight that basically disappeared. It was a flight coming... Um, Malaysia Airlines 370, not, there, was three, there were 17, but this one is 370, uh, that was going from Lumpar to Beijing. It disappeared. It was a Boeing 777 with 227 passengers, 12 crew, members on board, and basically it just disappeared over the Indian Ocean, uh, west of Australia, Central Asia area. It just, poof, gone. Uh, it, there was... Wreckage was found up on some beaches and stuff, and then they went back and people started to track this through ham radios and things like that. They found out that the plane, uh, the systems were turned off for tracking. The system went into, uh, the plane went into a 20-minute holding pattern, so it flew around for 20 minutes before it decided to go anyplace. It then completely flew a new course. Um, debris, de debris was discovered on the French island of Renown about... 2,300 miles west of the Indian Ocean area, uh, and they, Australians and everybody started to search for this plane. This was back in 2014. So nobody basically knows what happened to this plane. It just, you know, first they're saying, well, the pilot decided to commit uh, this, um, I can't remember, what am I on? Can I say the word? He decided to take yeah. his own life, uh, and then he just took everybody with him, and people were saying, no, 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 he would have never done that. Malaysia came out and said, hey, this is a CIA operation. We're going we're gonna to come back to that. <laughs> um, and, you know, everybody was coming back with trying to find this plane that just disappeared. Uh, you guys can, go, you know, look it up. It's, you know, MH370. And There's a documentary on huge that. Huge documentaries on that. So my focus wasn't how that happened or, you know, what happened. Mine was Why? I just want to look at why it happened. So the first thing I started with was, okay, who's on the plane? What's on the plane? Right? And there was a lot of different um, conspiracies in regards to, you know, the people on the plane and things like that. But the important aspect that I kind of wanted to go into was the people on the plane from Freescale Semiconductor. Now, free sale semiconductor is an important aspect of all of this quantum computing and semiconductors and things like that. So, free scale semiconductor was a um, spin off of Motorola. But in 2006, free scale semiconductor planned to begin selling a memory chip. Now, I'm just going to kind of break it down so everybody understands it's called MRAM. And the difference of this chip with every other chip was. This chip was immensely fast at being able to process information. This was a monstrous, monstrous um, aspect to quantum computing because that we could do quantum computers, but we didn't have the hard drives or the memories that uh, the memory chips that could keep up with the system. We didn't have that. So no matter what, it's like we could throw a fastball at 350 miles an hour, but there's no catcher that could catch it. So it's right. useless. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Well, Freescale Semiconductor created a memory chip called MRAM that could catch that 350-mile-an-hour fastball. It literally changed the game when it comes to quantum computing. So what, after that process, they did that. Now, they did that with, obviously, companies that we might know a couple of them, like DARPA. <laughs> DARPA is a famous company, um, and DARPA was and the Department of Defense were all um, investing into the Motorola slash Freescale semiconductor um, to basically create this technology and this semiconductors and these chips. Uh, they invested a lot of money in it. They were also, you know, a part of this, and they got this done. So the memory breakthrough was a large part of doing of DARPA and the, which is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. Um, the same Pentagon gang that gave us the internet. So the pay, same people that helped create the internet 
basically were pumping $200 million into this company to, to create this chip, and they did, or things like this. Now, DARPA has, is obviously into technology and into different aspects of space and, and, and creating the internet and things like that. Um, and we're going to hear a lot more DARPA as we go through this. So then one of the next things that happened was Freescale starts to continue to move forward, uh, creating chips and semiconductors and things like this. But what the Department of Defense and, and the Pentagon and everybody else comes forward and basically says, look, this is very dangerous. We have got to, this is back in 2007, 2008, 2009, they're releasing reports, they're, they're sending things to Congress, they're putting together think tanks, and all of them are saying the same thing. The intellectual property for, the, for these type of semiconductors and this type of quantum computing is dangerous. We have got to maintain control of the intellectual property of this, and we have to be the first to get this technology, right? And these are all in reports. Like I said, I've, I've got a bunch of reports. And when I show a documentary, I'll pull them all up and I'll, I'll read it. But I don't, I'm trying to do this within the time frame because it's a little long. So stay with you me. Don't, don't fall asleep. As long as you want. I'm just. <laughs> so after that, um, you have 20, in 2012, no, 2013. So in 20, end of 2012, 2013, NASA and Google come out to build quantum computing. So NASA and Google team up to start to do this, to build the computers, because we now have the chips that can catch the information. Well, the Department of Defense and political people, and I can't get the names because I'm trying to figure out who the political people are, but I know the Department of Defense and DARPA come in and tell NASA and Google to stop. Don't build these. Now, that's what's being said. I don't know if they continued on, but I'm just saying that they basically came out and said, stop building these computers. Uh, we, we don't, we're not ready for this technology. We're not ready to protect this technology. Now, understand, we, at this time, we still have an open agreement to share intellectual property with China to some aspect. Unless it's uh, defense-type stuff or military-type stuff, we are kind of in this you know, sharing, caring agreement which I believe is the dumbest thing we've ever done, but let's, yeah. we'll, we'll forget that. Um, and these are companies that are also working with companies like Curtis Wright. Uh, Curtis Wright Corporation is a monstrous aerospace, defense, technology, uh, naval type company. Um, and they're working with companies like this, and they basically say, stop building this. So in 20, that was 2013. So in 2012 and 2013, that same time frame, a new CEO comes into Freelance, uh, into Freescale Semiconductor. So free, and he basically says, look, we're going to streamline, we're going to optimize, we're going to basically niche ourselves into a specific category, and that was quantum computing. And we're going to start sending all, you know, our people and streamlining that. So we're not, you know, we're not going to do so much of this. We're going to try to streamline and build this. This is the future, and this is where we're going to go. So one of the other aspects that he basically does, and I have an exterior, uh, what's it called, a security exchange report, uh, basically, that, that, that they file, which I could probably pull up. Uh, in this 2012 uh, security, let me make sure I read. Yeah, so this, what screen are you copying? This one? I yeah. think you're on this one. You want me to add it? Yeah, you can add it. Um, so right here I, is the United States Security Exchange Commission of 2012 when he comes aboard. I can blow this up. And in here, oh, I don't know why that happened. It'd be better if we go to one screen, I guess. Sorry about that. Um, but basically in here, they have to basically dic state what the futures of the company is and the direction that they're going to go and what their plans are with the company. Well, what his plans are with the company that he specifically says in here is he wants to push more of his business into the Asian market and over to China to produce some of the semiconductors that um, are now being used for quantum computing. I think one of the reasons is 
he they wanted to be some of the, one of the first to come out with these chips so that they could lock in them lock themselves into that market but you're mm-hmm. not going to be able to do that unless because right now the government was coming out and saying look we don't want you building these right now we need to control these this needs to be you know under our under our thumb so he says well i'm going to move some of my stuff over to to china right uh, and he stay, he puts this in this exchange commission agreement and this was in basically 2012, the same time they're telling other people that don't make them. 2014, he decides for some whatever reason, and I've got people that are basically questioning this, Freescale Semiconductor puts 20 of their top engineers, I mean the top, the ones that are basically carrying the company in intelligence and experience that in in training that these are the people that train other people these are the people that you know if you have a problem if you have something they're coming down you're going to them and they're instructing you how to do it top engineers in a quantum computing semiconductor field this isn't a field that you can just pick up we're not looking for like hey I, we need another vet we need another veterinarian. This is a field in which you have a very small group of people that could be doing what these people are doing that are working for the United States, right? I mean, this is why he would put all 20 of them on the same flight. That flight was MH370. That flight was on its way with 20 of the top semiconductor top quantum computing people from basically from the U.S. origin to fly to Beijing, China with whatever cargo they had in the bays. Now, people are like, batteries? I don't know what it was, and we're never going to know because I can't pull cargo information. I can only pull passenger information. But whatever was in there, whatever chips, whatever processing, whatever quantum computer that could have been reverse engineered, and the people that were, could have trained the people in China to do it, disappeared. Disappeared. Just gone. Just Oof. gone. And nobody knows what happened. So at this point, I know, and I know a bunch of stories came out in regards to patents, and then the Rockefeller got the patent to the cloaking and all this other stuff, but China doesn't care about patents. China doesn't care who holds the patent. If they're going to reverse engineer something, they're going to reverse engineer it. And that's also now how a patent works. Like, if I create a, something in my garage and I patent it, well, I get the patent. But if you're working for a company like Freescale Semiconductor and you create something, you're on the patent, but the company owns the patent, <laughs> right? Like, your name's on it as a, as a you know, contributor or whatever. But if you pass away, the company still owns the patent. They, you don't, so, that, so I didn't... That made no sense to me. So what made sense to me is that if you wanted to stop people from going over to China and, get, and giving them potential technology and training, because the plant they were going to was where things get tested. It was an actual testing facility. So it was the end of the road. It wasn't, hey, we put this piece on here, we send it someplace else. It was the end of the road. So whatever was there was ready to be sent out and be sold. So if you were going to reverse engineer something, this was the plant that you could reverse engineer it if you wanted to steal it. Okay, so let's let's pause here for a second because I know we're about to transition into uh, the plant itself and and some of the stuff around that. And let's and let's recap. So we've got uh, you know your riddle in the beginning. Um, basically. You can use quantum computers. A quantum computer could literally destroy literally, New York City. Yeah, you could literally not destroy it per se, but you would... And uh, make it useless. Right, you would render it completely useless. Correct. Every single body that's in New York in financial, in, in economics, in policy, every single facet of, Correct. of you know, m- basically any major metropolitan that doesn't physically manufacture something could be deemed irrelevant by this technology. Easily. Uh, yeah. So you have uh, this this company Freescale mm-hmm. who developed this MRAM chip, which is, um, to, to, for lack of a better term, it's 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 one of the most incredible discoveries in computing. 
Correct. From, from the point of silicon to the point of being able to now quantum computing was tangible because we had the ability not just to process the information, but to fastly be able to accept. It's like, a, it's like going from a Polaroid camera to a digital camera. The information, your, your digital camera, it's just there. Once you take the picture, it's just there. That's MRAM. That's actually small pieces of MRAM. So there's no wait time, and that's what quantum computing needed. No so wait time. The, so then this Freescale company puts 20 of the... Are, are they the only ones that invented this, or are they the primary? They're the primaries. Like, they probably had people underneath them that, were, that right. you know, they were in charge of that would come to them and they do stuff. But these were the ones that would be like, nope, this is how we have to do it. These were the trainers and the top people because they were literally going over there to teach and train the people in Beijing or wherever they were going to put them how to do it, how to, what this was and what we're looking for and how we're streamlining it. Okay, and the United States had been telling them, don't do this. They've like, been telling uh, companies that we don't, don't go down this route, don't do this. You know, I don't know for, I do know that they were telling companies to, like I said, they told NASA and Google to stop. And, I, and then all of a sudden this company says, well, we're going to go to Asia. <laughs> so I don't know if somebody came into their place and said, You're not, we're not going to let you do this here. And they just decided to do that. Or if they saw it coming and they just said, we're going to start moving aspects over to there and do more over there okay and so now we have mh370 yep. takes off from malaysia or uh no it took off from technically when it was in the flight it was um lumbar lumbar which yeah. is where uh let me pull that up actually yeah, I think you, that's yeah in... let's pull up a map just so people can see so Mal while he's going through that one yeah. thing that i found malaysia about... malaysia yep so it was from in malaysia going to beijing so they and then from the, and these people basically were cr coming from the United States. They flew to Malaysia because there was some training in Malaysia for a secondary plant, not the final plant, but the secondary plant. So after training people in Malaysia, they got on a plane to go train the final people, the finishing lab in Beijing. And it never made it to Beijing. So whatever they were bringing from Malaysia that had to get tested in, in Beijing, and these people had to train the people to show them what to look for and what to do, it never made it. It just disappeared. And so for, for everybody listening, like when he says disappeared, legit disappeared. They yes. still, to this very day, have no explanation for what happened to this airline. It just completely and totally disappeared. If you watch the Netflix documentary, there were people that, you know, scoured the ocean through satellite imagery from that day and from that time trying to find it. Mm -hmm. There were some that it somehow made its way all the way down into the uh to the south i think it was like way in the south atlantic down by antarctica um you know there's all all sorts of theories there's been people that claim to have uh a, a found debris from the flight serial numbers and all this other stuff that um even my wife who's who's a big you know skeptic when it comes to this stuff was like yeah that that's not right <laughs> um, yeah we were watching it and they're like they're like, oh, yeah, we, we just happened to find the serial numbers on it. And it was like it it was weird. Like, I think they were like they were supposed somebody had said something like it's supposed to be engraved on there. And instead it was a plate, I think, that was mounted on there. And, and they're yeah. like, that's not how they do it. You know, the 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 Boeing, I think it was Boeing that made the flight um, that made the plane. Mm -hmm. That's not how Boeing does it. Like, it's not it, it's it's crazy when you watch it. It gets very conspiratorial on Netflix. But Netflix never mentions this uh, this uh, free uh, free scale free scale semiconductor. Right, they never mention it. They do mention that there was some precious cargo on there, but again, they allude that it's batteries, um, you know. And so, you have this plane that absolutely disappears, and now all of a sudden, uh, I think two weeks ago, we get this report all of a sudden that uh, MH370 was caught on an NOL NOLR22 satellite. And also in a uh, thermal imaging, so two separate images of a plane that has three orbs come and start hovering around it, and all of a sudden, poof, it disappears. Like you, you're watching it, you you watch it just flying, and these orbs start circling around it, and right. boom, it's gone. I did see that, and, I, and of course, I did see some people say, "Okay, that's a hoax, and it's been proven by this, and it's this." But I, look, I don't know if that's real or not, but I do know that the people on this plane and the plane is missing. You know what I'm saying? So, so that's why I know a lot of people are, you know, I, I'm trying, my goal was to stay focused on the why and what happened 
what would happen if this specific plane disappeared? Like, what was the consequences of this plane? Was there none or was there one? And there was one. There was a monstrous one to the point that the next step, and, and, and even in articles, it basically says, you know, um, the loss of 20 key free-scale semiconductor employees in the disappearance of Malaysia Airline on Saturday weighs, weighs questions about whether the company should have allowed so many of them to board the plane at the same time. But security aspects said that uh, at a big corporation, it's hard to avoid. It was a blow to the Austin, Texas free-scale. The vanished employees were engineers who specialized in involving especially involved in projects to stream and cut costs in key manufacturing facilities in China and Malaysia. And the, it, this, this person goes on that says this was nuts. You got, you know, uh, 1958, the loss of eight players on a, on a you know, soccer team. They decided not to do that anymore. So the fact that these guys did this, and it, it was a monstrous blow to the company in 2014. So much that the company basically went down. It crushed the company. It crushed the company. This, so for me, I'm looking at this, okay, so the aspect of this plane disappearing destroyed a company which was now bringing pos, you know, quantum computing semiconductor technology to technically our enemy in 2014. Who, you know, we did not want them to get this technology. We don't want them to. So the next thing that happened was... Uh, in 2015, the company, Freescale is going down, and, and they're not surviving from this. They are, there's the, at the time, there, it was the largest merger ever, and that was NXP announcing a $40 billion merger with Freescale. So NXP, another semiconductor plant out of, they're Dutch. They were Dutch semiconductor plant, um, basically said, hey, we're going to buy this. Now, there is international monopoly laws. Sometime, in some, when things like this happen, you know, China can come in and say, look, it, we're not going to approve this. This is going to become a monopoly and stuff like that, right? Well, so before this happens, <laughs> NXP CEO basically comes out and says, we are in favor of the China 2025 strategy. And, he and it says, uh, when you think about the 2025 strategy, Industry 4.0, and he comes out and says, look, 2025 strategy is, is everything should be manufactured in China, not finished in China, not just put together in China, but actually the starting process for manufacturing of technology, chips, and things like that should be done in China. That's what they, so that, now you're not shipping it from Taiwan to China or from here to China. It's all done in China. This was the focal point to him for what he called, this is the NXP CEO, he called Smarter World, which we know as smart cities. I don't know if you've heard that term, right, the smart city terms? Yep. Okay. Well, this was the start of the smart cities. NXP wanted to create Smarter World. Uh, according to him, with the Smarter World strategy, the focus on the company is on being able to drive secure connections and make life easier to make the way people do things in their daily lives much easier than it is, but also to make it safer and more secure. That's smart cities, right? So you had to have this technology to create what they call the smart world to make smart cities. And that's, you, we know that there's a push for that now. Once China found out that they, were, uh, that they were on board with the China 2025, the merger goes through. So in 2015, the merger goes through. Okay? Now, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go regress a little bit here in a second because you're going to be like, holy crap, you got to be kidding me. And I'm not. I'm not kidding you. So in 2015 and 2016 area, China comes out and says that they're going to invest in the largest semiconductor plant in the world, uh, and they're going to start making top-of-the-line semiconductors um, you know, that they're creating now, the, the things that basically go into these quantum computers and other high-tech technology. 
And remember, semiconductors do everything from, you know, you were in the military, if you needed to call in a drone attack, it's pinpointing and actually zooming in on its target. Those are all semiconductors to make sure it hits the right target, right? I mean, this is the processing of information. The, the faster it can process that information, the better we, you can hit targets during war, right? I mean, that's just the way war is progressing. It's progressing less boots on the ground, less drones in the air, right? Correct. So they're going to make the top semiconductor plant. Where, if I were to ask you, where do you think they were going to make that semiconductor plant? Does anybody in the chat know where they were going to build the largest semiconductor plant to make the fastest semiconductors to be able to process quantum computing? Can anybody take a guess? Somewhere in China. Somewhere mm. in China, they were going to build this plant. Well, I know if the I, answer, so I'm going to let the chat answer. Yeah. So how long should I give them? Should I let them know? <laughs> uh, you can count down like just a couple of seconds. Yeah, in China. We established China. Bingo! Coleman 2000 has it. Wuhan. They build a plant 10 miles from the lab that may or may not have allegedly, possibly, but it did it, let out COVID. 10 miles away from that lab 10 miles and I, i'm not i'm now let's dive into what else was happening in 2014 in wuhan and this is where i had to talk with um uh, cancon so in 2014 the you can probably dive into this more uh eco health am i right eco health basically received some money or it had some, I guess, some cash flowing around, a couple millions of dollars, and they said, hey, you know where we should send it? We should send it to a Wuhan lab in China to do what? Well, we don't know. Wink, wink. But Gain of function. Gain of function. Gain of function. At the same, at the same time, the, the, the reason we shipped it over there is because Obama literally shut it down here in the United States. We were doing it here in the U.S. And they shut it, they shut it down in October of 2014. And that's when EcoHealth started getting their contracts to go do it over in Wuhan. Yeah. So in 2014, we start sending money over to the Wuhan lab. 2014 is a fantastic year for, chem for uh, pathogens. Let me just tell you that. In 2014, we also had somebody else dive into the pathogen. And that was DARPA. Yep. DARPA opened up a, so DARPA started the Friend or Fro program that aims to develop bio-surveillance technology that can detect uh, bacterial pathogens as or even before the threat for military and the homeland. So they basically came out with a bio, I think it's the, um, let me pull up my thing here, biotech lab they decided to come out with in regards to DARPA. Did I send you that file? I think I did. Let me click on that. Let me open that up real quick. I'm not the, just so everybody knows, I'm not the, I, I read well quietly, but when I go to read out loud, it's the multitasking thing that my brain doesn't process very well. So if you guys bear with me. But anyways, they're basically, they come out with something that the whole goal was now to start to study Ah, here it is. One area of increase DARPA focused on is life sciences. While DARPA had been conducting biotechnology research for some time, in 2014 it created a new biological technologies office with one of its thrusts centered on synthetic biology, forms of genetic engineering. Isn't that kind of what they did in Wuhan? Um, that opens new opportunities for such applications as sensing hazardous compounds and the efficiency of bio products of novel coating fuels and drugs. Another driver for this technology was the DOD's own mass health concerns as injured soldiers from two wars require medical responses. So basically, DARPA in 2014 is the same time uh, Echo Health was getting money and sent to Wuhan. DARPA was opening up basically a COVID style defense tech lab here. They wanted to protect 
soldiers and the homeland from a, bo- from a bo- uh, pathogen-style flu like COVID in the same year we were sending money to COVID. Sending money to Wuhan to create COVID. Sounds weird, right? Sounds weird. You know, what, you know what's interesting about all this, Sage? You know about the Chinese defector that came over to the United States? Um, I, uh, there's been so many. It, it, was, it was recently. It was recently. So uh, Bongino talks about this a lot on his podcast. There was a defector that came over to the United States, and he reached out to a, uh, a journalist for the Wall Street Journal. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, just a couple days after they met uh, or, or spoke, the, the journalist for the Wall Street Journal wrote an article saying that the next world war, World War III, will be fought using viruses. And he said both vi- biological viruses and computer viruses. And yeah. this is a, China, a China, Chinese spy coming over to the United States and saying this. It's very interesting. Yeah, I could see that. Because the other thing they did in 2014 was create uh, another, se- uh, um, not just create, but um, focus more in on the semiconductor situation in 2014, basically. They also, DARPA did that. Now, I'm going to be honest. Like, I understand DARPA diving into the semiconductor thing. Hey, they're in space. They created the internet. They did all that stuff, right? I, I'm a, I'm, I get it. Here's what I, where I kind of say, okay, red flags start to go up. So we all know about Event 201. Event 201 was October 18th, 2019, where a group of people got together. John Hopkins, you would expect John Hopkins. They're the main, they're a teaching hospital. So they teach other doctors how to be doctors, stuff like that. And they, they pop, and with world leaders and stuff, and they said, hey, what would happen if something, if some type of pathological, you know, pathological, some type of uh, COVID situation were to happen, right? And, and they, they ran a drill. I understand that. Uh, you also have the Clyde X. That was done in 2018. Um, we, you have, uh, what was it, Dark? What was the one in 205? Oh, man, what was the other one we talked about? Oh, uh, not Dark Mirror. Um... Uh, well, there was Atlantic one, right? There, then, well, wasn't it like Dark Atlantic or Dark Winter? Dark Winter, yeah, something like Dark that. Winter. Dark Winter, right? And Because and we he even... That's how we, so we do have these. We do these. We run these drills. I get it. But they're normally run by people in the medical fields, John Hopkins hospitals, medical doctors and things like that, and then world leaders and stuff like that. Didn't, Obama, didn't uh, Biden say it was going to be a dark winter? Yes, too? and he even mentioned the term dark winter um, and, and things like that. And, and, of course, I don't know if Biden just happens to be like a kid. I see kids going around all the time, and somebody says the word Halloween. Next thing you know, the little kid's saying, Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. I kind of think Biden might be doing the same thing. <laughs> like, he's like that little kid that you're like, you know, he becomes that parrot because he doesn't really know what to say, so he just repeats words that sound right. So I don't, I don't know if it was something he knew or somebody, he happened to be falling asleep in a room and heard Dark Winter, and he says, that's a cool term. I want to use it. You know what I mean? I don't know, because I'm not going to lie. I'm not, uh, you guys, you know, forgive me, but I'm not a Biden's fan. I know you're, you're I've been joking around here, but it's just. <laughs> oh, you, you just lost half my audience. I know. I'm sorry if that, if that offends anybody, uh, but I'm not. I feel that it's elder abuse. I'm not going to lie at this time. I, I, to be completely honest and logical about it, I feel that there, it's, it's elder abuse. Um, I do feel that there should be real quick ages to, for president. You should be at a certain age. If, if we want to keep up with technology, we can't have somebody in office that was there before the invention of scotch tape. Like Feinstein was literally, I think she is older. I think she lived before scotch tape. I'm not lying. If somebody might look it up at her, I mean, you, you now have people like Diane Feinstein. It's like at, at some point, these are the people, we're going into the new tech, we're going into the new age, we're going into computers and these people have no concept of it and and i don't believe at some point we have to have you know congressmen and senators and stuff that you know hey look i was the i was actually the first to see the wheel you know i we can't have that so anyways so we have these events that take place and that's fine well darpa had an event on 2012 they had basically one of their own little meetings that they had um, the same, and, and it was for Detect with Gene Editing Technology, D-I-G-E-T. I blew this up. Show my screen. Yep. Um, and by the way, uh, Scotch Tape is eight years older 
than Diane Feinstein. You looked it up? I knew it was close, man. I knew it was close. Eight years older. <laughs> it's kind of scary. Um, so in a twist, DARPA in a twist, I like how they worded that, on how gene edi editing technology might be applied in the future, DARPA's newest biotechnology funding opportunity aims to incorporate gene editing into detectors. That means that they're going to be able to detect if something's had gene editing done to it for distribution of health biosurveillance on rapid point of need diagnostic and ad academic emerging. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me, uh, you read let this? me hit this. Yeah. You're kind of getting some, some words wrong. Yeah. I know. I know. Um, I, 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 it's go ahead. Fire away. Okay. So it says, uh, point of need diagnostics for endemic, endemic. emerging and engineered pathogenic threats The detect it with gene editing technologies, dig it, uh, program could help the Department of Defense maintain force readiness by informing rapid medical response and increasing the standard of care for troops and preserve geopolitical stability by preventing the spread of infectious disease from becoming a driver of conflict. That's scary. Conflict to what? Conflict with other countries? Yep. All right. Now, this hosted took place on December 11th, 2019 in Atlanta. All right. So DARPA just happens to be putting this out on December 12th. There happens to be a cluster of patients in China <laughs> in the city of Wuhan to begin to experience symptoms of a flu like illness that does not re respond well to standard treatment. This is December 11th. This was December 12th. And I pulled this off the COVID page. I literally pulled this off the COVID timeline page. Okay. Now, this is where I start to say red flag. I understand hospitals doing it. I understand all this other stuff doing it. My problem is when DARPA starts to do stuff, DARPA, who is basically, let's just say, they're designed for wartime aspects, you know, deep secret type stuff, they're, starts to do this. That makes me a little nervous. Wouldn't, doesn't it you? Yes, absolutely. I mean, especially with the timing a day apart, a man. day before symptoms, a day, not a year, not six months, a day. Something else, Sage, that might be interesting for uh, some of your research moving forward. You go back to that 2014, 2015 timeline, and that is when um, the Rothschilds began the patent. They filed the first patent for uh the the software basically that is used to detect covid in these uh tests that we're seeing today this is back in 2015 now they don't call it covid back then they don't call it covid19 back then because of course covid19 back then wasn't a thing yeah. but since uh they modified the patent i think in 2017 and finally again in 2019 and then that's when we got uh the testing there so again just another with, with Malaysia disappearing and everything back then in 2014, it's just another, uh, and going, was the Wuhan plant, was that up in 2014? Yeah, because they were giving money. They, they, it was yeah. there. They were giving the money to it at that point. Yeah, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, suspicious. That right. The Rothschilds, and, and Reuters, <laughs> Reuters has fact-checked this, and if you read the fact-check, you have to read the whole fact check. Don't just read the headline because the headline you'll be like, oh, CanCon's full of shit. But if you actually read the whole fact check, you'll see them exactly right. Yeah. Now, again, somebody mentioned Facebook. A lot of analytics and studying and data collection uh, of, of, to, to train these computers has been done by Facebook. Facebook was one of the main um, social media platforms that these companies were collecting this data to do this, absolutely. So that is another part of, of the algorithm system. I, somebody mentioned that. I wanted to throw it out there. Okay, so now, this was 10 miles. So now we have DARPA doing this. We have the vid coming out, COVID coming out. It's 10 miles from the plant, which is this plant here, um, that made this. I mean, 10 miles is the plant. Now, is there other labs in China, bio labs? Absolutely, there's other labs in China. But this one was picked as they were building, as they were building this chip lab, the Wuhan lab was picked to get the money to do this. They didn't pick any other lab in China. They picked this one. Okay? 
No, it's not the patents. Um, somebody just real quick. Um, 370 disappeared with three of the patent holders with the Rothschilds. Nope. Actually, the problem is, is China doesn't care about pa patents. They don't give a shit. They don't care. Like, you can have all the patents in the world, but if you're flying that technology to China, there's no more patents. You're not, it's just, it's going to be reverse engineered. So, the first thing that China did when COVID came out was they literally locked this plant down. And I got this from a Korean article, or from a Korean uh, news page right here, that they literally locked this down. This plant was told to stay functioning, stay open. Nobody leaves. Nobody comes in. We'll basically, you know, we'll bring the people in. We'll shuffle the, uh, the there was a train that normally did not stop here, like one of their subway systems. And they, ba the, China basically said, no, you're, that train's going to start stopping at this semiconductor plant and being able to feed the people and, and bring in goods that they need. They treated this plant like it was ground zero, like it was being attacked specifically. Everything else they let shut down. They shut down manufacturing. We all know what happened, right? We all know China was shutting a bunch of stuff down. They weren't building things. This plant stayed open. And it, all of the, the 300 labored engineers for more than a month, they, they stayed to keep this plant running. The country didn't care I, I can't emphasize this enough. It was like their war zone. They needed to keep this open. What was the name of that plant? Uh, this one right here. Okay. Yahtzee Memory Technologies. Hold on. Let me pull this up. China lets Wuhan tech plant bypass lockdown to stay open. Flash memory make maker Yangtze Memory Technologies, China's hope for creating a rival to Samsung Electronics, SK Hynix, Hynix Kioxa, and Micron, receives special approval from local and central governments to continue to ship products out of the city and has been receiving materials for production since the start of February. Two sources with direct knowledge of the matter told the Nike Asian Review. Right. So this one, they're just like, this is, we don't care, this is it. So now my opinion, my opinion, of course, is I believe COVID was released to basically, hopefully, take down this plant and possibly make the individuals who work there sick to the point that they might not have either survived or they could have slowed down and things like that. Uh, China knew that and went into damage control to protect that plant. Now, we had to take a hit because... The last thing you want to do is admit that you possibly got something got out to, to do this. So it's a cover up, right? We have to make we have to take it look hit. Like when I remember when I used to coach hockey, one of my players would do something stupid and trip somebody. And he probably should have got a worse penalty, but because I overreacted and told him to shut up, get in the box, that was a dumb move. Now we're shorthanded, stuff like that the referee would a lot of times not give him that worst penalty. Does that make sense? Like, mm -hmm. so we had to over, so now we're under lockdowns. We're putting masks on. Now that gives us an opportunity to sell our, our V. Uh, can I say it here or no? I don't know. Yeah. All right. So it gives us an opportunity to say, to sell our vaccine and hopefully get other countries hooked on our vaccine and things like that. Well, that doesn't go well because we're fighting it. Everybody knows we're fighting it. So other countries are basically saying, well, if you people won't even take it, what the hell are we going to take? It? You know what I'm saying? So that didn't go well. And it wasn't something it should have been tested a hell of a lot longer. But now my question is, was it being tested a hell of a lot longer if you have DARPA creating stuff in 2014? Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying? So whatever's being given now. So China goes in and says, okay, we're, we locked down our plants. They keep pumping out chip. In 2018, they get best of class chips. Um, in 2019, they're making, you know, top, of no top notch chips out of this plant. Well, COVID's over. Boom. COVID ends, and we say, hey, we're done here. Uh, we can all take off the mask. Amazingly, it's gone, and now you're also dying from the flu. Now a motorcycle accident isn't a COVID death. It's amazing. So at some point, immediately almost, we do the CHIPS Act. So it, it's almost like, to me, it's like how quickly the timeline merged. When we figured out COVID wasn't going to work, we did the CHIPS Act. And the CHIPS Act specifically targeted this plant and others and basically said, look, 
Nobody can buy anything from this plant. No American workers can work in China. You basically give up your citizenship or, or, or not. Um, you know, uh, anybody that's with us, we sanctioned the hell out of, this, out of this plant with the CHIPS Act. And this was a big deal because they are literally putting billions of dollars into this chip. So in December 2022, uh, this chip, which is YMTC, that's, that's easier, was added to the U.S. entry list. In February 2020, in February, the company reportedly laid off 10% of its workforce, canceling uh, equipment orders and delaying the plant's expansion plan. So we literally hit it with the CHIPS Act, and now they're laying people off, they're delaying expansion plans, and, and everything else. So they literally, it, the CHIPS Act hit them. That CHIPS Act was the start, in my opinion, is going to be considered the start of World War III if it keeps progressing more and more. Does that make sense? Like, going back, you will look, people, you could look at this and say, if World War III happens, going back, they will look at this and say the CHIPS Act was the start of it. It was the start of, of technically World War III. And how it progresses from here depends on how it's handled and who's the one handling it. You know, I mean, do we have Biden handling it? Or does Trump come in and handle it differently? Or does the other guy come in? Whoever comes in is going to decide on which way this is going to progress. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, BRICS. And um, guys, you guys are probably all familiar with BRICS. Uh, that's the... Um, it's a trading, it's a trading group, actually. And it's Brazil, India, China, Russia, and South Africa right now. That's why it's called BRICS. And a lot more now. Right. As of right now. I mean, the others are probably going to be signing up and joining up and wanting a part of it. But it's a trading pact. I think they did officially sign up. Did they? Yeah. So they'll be, yeah. they'll be, you know, put in and things like that. Now, um, I was in, a lot of people are going to hate me for this, and I don't want to lose people, but just... Go with me on it, if you would, please. So a lot of people thought that, and I told CanCon before it happened. This is not me basically armchair quarterbacking. I told him before. I just didn't, we just didn't have time for me to put this out in the video. But a lot of people thought that BRICS was going to release their own currency and back it by gold and silver. And that's not going to happen. My, what I feel is going to happen is China's response to the, to the chips and the sanctions on the chip manufacturing and, the, uh, and our version of the CHIPS Act, I want you kind of, we all have to look at it from this aspect. Right now, if you wanted to create a currency that you did not want your enemy to have control of and you wanted to dominate your enemy, you would not use gold and silver because we have the most gold and silver. Now, I had talked to CanCon and, and he said, well, you know, Fort Knox is empty. I, I haven't been there. Well, it could be empty. It could so be empty. You see what I'm saying? And I, I do believe, but the problem is, is that I have to go on the, the great scale what everybody believes. Like if you Google who, much has, who has the most gold, they're going to say the United States by, by a lot, right? So I, we're going to go under that impression because that technically is what's out there. And I do believe we have a lot of gold. I believe the CIA stole a lot of gold from other countries. I believe they've seized a lot. So I do believe we have a ton. But you're not going to back it by gold and silver if your other country, has, if the country you don't want to, to get it has access to gold and silver and they have the most. But what you would want to do is take their people and make them think that it was going to be backed by gold and silver. So that everybody, because there's, and I see it pushed all day long on YouTube. Trust me, I've gotten into disagreements with people who have pushed it uh, and things like that. But if the people are swapping over their 401ks and the people are buying gold and silver and the people are buying that thinking that a currency for like BRICS or someone else is going to back their uh, currency by gold and silver, you have a massive rush of people buying gold and silver. And then the first thing people say is, well, why are countries buying gold and silver? Well, the reason a country buys gold and silver is that if they want to do business with the U.S., or a country that works with the U.S. and they're at war, they can't give them U.S. dollars because they're not going to exchange that. One of the reasons um, Hitler lost the war 
is nobody would take German dollars. So when he needed steel to build and he needed to buy this from other countries, they wouldn't take his German dollars because he was at war with the United States. But he had no gold and silver to trade. He had nothing else, so he went into other countries and tried stealing theirs so he could support his, you know, push, push on. So what happens with gold and silver is you, China would make you think that it's going to go that way. And then down the road, what they... What they're going to do is they're, going to, they're not going to create a Briggs currency with gold or silver. And next thing you know, the price of gold and silver slowly starts to go down because it, everything was based on that. Does that make sense? It's that supply and demand. So one of the other reasons, and I try to explain to people, that you can't just get rid of the United States is we are a consumer of goods. So if you were to plop us into the world and look at it like a business... We are the customer that buys things. We buy all kinds of stupid stuff. That's what we do. We, we make money and we buy stuff. We buy stuff from China. We buy stuff from here. That is one of our roles in the world. Before you get rid of your customer in business, you better have another customer lined up that can basically make as much, to give you as much money because you don't want to get rid of this customer and have nothing. Right. What they're trying to do is make Africa the new America for purchasing goods, right? They want to make, they want to supply Africa with a foundation money because they already know they have the, the rare earth minerals to make the semiconductors, but they want to make, you can't replace the United States unless you make Africa the new customer buying goods. So China wants Africa to buy as much stuff that we used to buy. Because for, you, for them to get rid of us without having a new customer, they'd go broke. Like, I, I, I have one customer, let's say. That customer's basically, I make all my money from that one customer. I'm not just going to go out and say, screw you, I'm not working with you anymore, unless I have another bigger customer lined up. Africa is the bigger customer that they're trying to line up. So what you need to do is you need to let Africa's dollar be backed by rare earth minerals. Not gold and silver, but lithium, cobalt, shit we don't have. Right. And I can tell you 100%, I am in logistics. I am in shipping. I move overdimensional freight. I am under the Defense Production Act to move freight into the rare earth minerals mine in Mountain Pass, California. The government comes in and says, you will do this. When we call you, drop everything you're doing <laughs> and ship these things in there immediately. Uh, and I have done lots of tanks. I, I, and not military tanks, they're, they're, fiber, they're, they're fiberglass tanks oh, and yeah. steel tanks that hold um, basically water, salt water, chemicals, fluoride, things like that. Not military. Wait, hold on. Let me let me ask you something real quick because we didn't talk about this when we spoke earlier. Yeah. Um, the Defense Production Act that you are uh, being summoned under. Mm -hmm. uh, when when was that instituted? Uh, I was put under about a year ago. I think I was. I I was. I mean, they were coming to me and basically saying, "Look, two years ago I started moving stuff into here, um, and then a year ago it 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 rocketed up." It rocked it up where they basically said, you're under it now. But do you know where the Defense Production Act, when it was uh, instituted for this specific, like not just you specifically, but... Oh, I don't. I, I could probably look that up and find it because I know yeah, we're I, under... That's a good question. I could look that up because I never, I never thought to look that up. Um, yeah, you should because if it's, if it's something outside of COVID, then it's kind of gone under all of our radar. I mean, we know Trump... Uh, instituted the uh, or enacted the Defense Production Act in uh, 2020 uh, in response to COVID, but that was supposed to be for medical uh, equipment and, and stuff like that. It wasn't supposed to be for uh, rare earth minerals being mined out in California. So I'd be really curious if this was something that kind of tagged along with the CHIPS Act. Um, it could have. It could have. It, that would make sense. It would tag along. And I, I see some people not believe me. You let me know what part you don't believe because I'm here with receipts. There's nothing, I, I mean, I, the biggest part people jump on me and they're like, no, 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 I, gold and silver, it's going to go to the moon. I'm just being honest with you. I'm just being, and, I, and I, just like I told 
you know, CanCon before, they're not going to go with a gold back currency. They're not. And I told, I, I work with a think tank. I told them the same thing before because you're going, the countries that they're teaming up with, India don't like China. China don't like India. So at some point, you're, they're going to want to build their own currency and establish their own currency's worth before they team up with a, a, a euro type thing, right? So you're really going to want to, to build up Africa's currency before you make them a part of BRICS. And to do that, you would go to Africa and you would start, banks would start loaning money out in African dollars. And then Africa would basically say, we will tether ours with lithium and cobalt because they're, they're the largest of, you know, that's what they're scooping up. And that's the same as iron ore was being, you know, dug up as fast as possible after World War II because we had tons of iron ore and we were out there making steel and we were building things and stuff like that is the same aspect of rare earth minerals for semiconductors. It's the same thing. Iron ore is to lithium as, you know, as that iron is to the semiconductor. That's the major race. And the, the, the dollar would be crushed. I mean, let's think about this. Let's say BRICS meets in 2024. And I have an article, which I'll put in the thing, that basically says... Russia is focused on working with quantum computers with, with countries like China and India at the next BRICS meeting in 2024. Um, and I probably could pull that one up real quick. But let's say in 2024, they come out and they say, hey, we're not going to tether any of our, our money to gold and silver. Uh, it's, it's weird, but we will tether it to um, cobalt and lithium. Well, a lot of people that are investing, big investors that are investing in uh, gold and silver are going to sell and it's going to drop down. But at that point, that would be just before our election. So what would happen? Just, just hypothetically, because this is what I do. Hypothetically, what would happen if in August of 2024, the price of gold drives down to, it's at 2000 right now. Let's just say 1000. It drops down to 1000, which it has been, it's been at 1000 before. People are going to go ballistic. They're going to lose half of their retirement. They're, all this money is, is going to be gone. They're going to hate the world. They're going to be nervous as hell. They're going to be in panic mode. And you have an election. People, some people are just going to say, screw it, I'm not voting. But the, which side throws more money at the people than anybody else? You tell me. <laughs> the Democrats. The Democrats course. do. So if you are just lost $100,000 of your investment money because this tanked, and now you're, you look like you're broke and you're going to lose all this and you're going to do all that, people are going to say, I, and, and the Democrats can easily come out and say, don't worry, we're going to do this, we'll throw money at this, we'll stabilize this, we'll throw that, we'll throw money. That's what they do. Next thing you know, people are just voting because they're, they're not voting because they want a Democrat. They're voting because they need to replace their retirement that just dropped. And if I, if I was China, that's exactly what I would do. I, exactly how I would collapse the United States from inside. And listen, at that point, when people lose all that money and they're going broke, we're our, we're our country. I, I'm a Second Amendment 100%, and if you don't have one, go get one. Uh, but it, it, it's going to be chaos in the streets. If it goes, the government's, not afraid of, uh, the government's not afraid of us coming after them with their guns. They're afraid of us basically imploding and taking out each other, of all of us, because that, that would be chaos. I mean, other countries would have to come in to stop. If a nuclear country goes to civil war, other countries are coming in to stop it. NATO is going to be on our doorstep. UN's going to be on our doorstep because we're right. a nuclear country in They're a shootout. I, I, they are, but, you see, but it'll be more obvious. You know what I'm saying? So this is just, look, uh, I'm just connecting dots. I'm just seeing, I know how different, how, I, I'm just watching how other countries, I've been in logistics for 20 years, watching the Belt Road Initiative, understanding China. Uh, my wife speaks Korean. And we, you know, we've had, we've, we speak to Koreans a lot. So I'm just giving you the dot connection. You're welcome to make up whatever mind you want or take it down the path. Like I said, when I put the documentary together, I'm coming with all the receipts, with all the articles, with all the dates, with, the, with all the you know, paperwork that says, here's the dots. 
and they all connect. And once DARPA got thrown in there, it was like, what the hell? I just believe that it was released, and then this is basically it. It's really wild to me that there's there's people and like I understand that this is some pretty in depth stuff here, but every single thing that that Sage has said so far here is documented. Yes. Every single thing. Now you're he's able to put the pieces together, and historically, guys, just do a search on Google, and look up China, Africa donations or not donations, uh, loans, loans. invest whatever they've since since the you know early uh, 2010. Since that that you know decade there, they've been investing billions in China. They the One Belt One Road Initiative throughout, or excuse me, in Africa, the One Belt One Road Initiative throughout uh, Africa. Uh, right when 2020 kicked off, Uganda, China came in and took over their only international airport as a uh, you know a payment because they defaulted on their loans. China's mm -hmm. forgiving these loans. China understands what's going on here. Correct. And if you look at what just happened at BRICS right now, India said, we're not going to get on board with this BRICS, uh, you know, commodity-backed currency. And so what you're saying now is that they're just going to trade in the African currency Correct. and back their currencies by their own resources, Correct. which we have none. It's actually a genius way yes. to cut the United States and our fiat currency to cut us out and and to make gold irrelevant, me and me and Sage were, Sage were talking about this. Gold is the most useless thing you'll ever see. It's pretty. That's the reason that gold is pretty is 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 valuable because it's pretty. It has very little industrial application. Silver, on the other hand, uh, has a ton of uh, industrial. Gold has a little bit. Okay, a little bit. We'll give it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it is it is a conductor. Um, you know, but, but is it is. And look, when I when also the stuff that understand that during the 1970s we had a, a problem with inflation and oil prices and stuff like that. One of the things that we did was we we pushed, we wanted basically cars and things like that to be like four cylinders. Like sometimes when we push for technology for electric cars, we're not looking for electric cars. We're really right. not. We're looking for the technology that it takes to build the electric car. Uh, so during the 1970s, we threw a ton of money for anybody that could come in and help us uh, get down our consumption on oil. Well, Japan, Japan came in and said, well, we build all kinds of four cylinder cars and, and things like that. And they came to the United States and they started manufacturing four cylinder cars. Um, and that was because of the issue that we had during the 1970s with inflation. So one of the things that we're doing is we're reaching out to companies like um, in Taiwan and basically pulling them to make to manufacture chips here. But that's not something that uh, you have to understand that the, the future is technology. And if you don't think so, th we're talking to you right now. I'm in Maine. He's in Florida. I mean, technology has brought us together to be able to talk to wherever you guys are. This is just this has been invented a long time ago. The concept of what the future holds in regards to quantum computers will rule the world it just will yeah yeah we're, we're seeing um i know they get angry when i talk about this and that's fine i catch i catch crap all the time but when i was saying before bricks went down that they will don't worry about a currency they're not coming out with a currency they won't i said this a year ago they won't they have to build a customer first because you can't get rid of the united states and not have someone to financially replace the united states China has people working because they're building stuff for, for us. A lot of it, you know, we, 60% of our stuff comes from, well, it used to, came from China. The ports and everything else, that all came from China. But you can't just dump a customer and not have a financial replacement. So they are slowly building Africa to be that financial replacement. And once Africa is, we're done. We're done. Well, and, and we're, like, like I said, we're behind the curve on this. Just throw that up right there. Yeah, that's the one. And I'll, like, and, and then also understand that once, once that happens, dollar bills come rushing back to the United States because nobody needs to hold as much dollar bills if you're working with these, other, with these other countries and you can get the goods that you need. And then if I'm China and China, and you wanna, and, and China wants to buy, let's say, uh, a tr uh, let's say a boat of corn. They order a bulk container ship of corn. And China says, well, we're not going to pay you in dollar bills. We're going to pay you in gold. 
We, we literally do not want your cash money. We don't want it. Well, that also forces dollar bills back to us and causes inflation. If there, listen, if I wanted to do this, this is exactly how I would destroy the United States if I was another country. This is exactly how I would do it. So if they're not doing it this way and all these dots are out there that show that and they're not, then they're dumb. Because if I can see it and they're not doing it, they're, they're crazy. Because this, we, it literally would take down the dollar. It literally would take us out of being the consumer of the world and replace us with somebody else. And then they would, people could slowly get rid of the United States, causing us to have higher inflation. And, and people are like, I understand, and people are like, well, bring all the manufacturing back to the United States. Bring it all back, and we'll make it all here. Okay, Who were, how do we feel the people needed to do that? There are a billion people in China. There is only 320 million here. Let's say half, let's say 300 million people are working in manufacturing in China. Just 300 million are just working. Where do we come up with the 300 people, 300 million people needed to work in this country to do, to, if we were to bring back all manufacturing? How do we do that? that? That's how much manufacturing is in China. We don't have, we'd have to double our population if we brought all manufacturing back. Or we'd have to go with automation, which is semiconductors. And th this, is, this is the threat that, like I said, if they're not doing it, I don't know. What, uh, it just all the dots for me, like I said, with the Malaysia flight, the people that were on it, what happened afterwards, the chips, the, the 2014 DARPA started uh, uh, you know, going into the gene editing protection uh, and next thing you know, 2016, they're finishing up the plant. Ten miles from the, this thing gets dropped, ten miles. China goes into damage control, focusing on this plant to make sure this stays up and running. We leave it out there for a while. Next thing you know, we get rid of COVID, and the next thing they do is the CHIPS Act. And now we're coming back into possibly having more masks uh, uh, mandates and possibility of, of another COVID strain that could possibly be coming out. And I, I just believe that it's, it's, it's war. And just like you said, there was going to be biological war, uh, uh, right? Biological, you said? Biological and computer. And computers. And the, these bo that now confirms this is exactly the two things that happen then. And yep. the people that are involved are people like DARPA and stuff like that, the ones that fight wars. Now, I wonder... Um... You know, I saw you mentioned it earlier, and I also saw somebody in the chat mention it earlier. I wonder if there's any tie to the uh, MHL 17. Yeah, that's a good point. Like I said, I, I just started with uh, 370, and I know that one was shut th shot down oh, either week Ukraine. before. Yeah, uh, I think a week it after. Was just after. Okay, because so, that that was the straw that broke the camel back. Because that was that was Malaysian Air as well, wasn't it? Yeah, it was an MH17, Malaysian Air 17. And yeah. I think it, that might have been a week after that one went down also. Now, I did not dive into that one yet. To me, it was like, okay, uh, you know, like I said, when I dove into Malaysia 370, I wanted to see why and what, what, when this plane went missing, was there any consequences to this? Like, a plane can go missing and there's no real con consequences. Like, people die and understand that and that's fine, or something happens and there's no real effect. There was a serious effect when this plane went missing. Like, this company was, this was a company that was backed by DARPA, backed by the government, being funded in, a, in an area of technology that the world is moving towards, that tech, you know, that the government was afraid of losing this technology. The government said we needed to protect this intellectual property. And that was, this plane held those consequences. And it held 20 of the top people. So that's where I said, okay, that's right there is where I got to focus. And that's when it started to take me into DARPA. And then what DARPA was also starting to focus into COVID um, and, you know, and semiconductors and COVID basically was in 2014, they, they did two specific things. DARPA started doing semiconductor technology and gene editing technology, which is slash what COVID technically was. Yeah. And then 2014, the money, that's when I called you, and the money was also given to this lab, which was 10 mile, being produced 10 miles from here. 
It started pumping out things. 2019, they had the meeting. To me, it's just it's too many consequences of too many departments focused on a certain point, right? Like DARPA kind of t- funneled it for me. Like I understand, you know, I, I do understand that they do this all the time with John Hopkins because it, we have to be ready. So just day before, <laughs> day before. So here's the interesting thing about this is uh, the, the MHL 17 was four months after it was in July of 2014. So it was four months after MH370 okay. coming from Eastern Ukraine down to uh, Kalua Lumpar. So the, you know, going back to Malaysia Yeah, and um, there's, we have a lot of bio labs in Ukraine, a lot. Like, I think we have like 36. Yeah. And we have them all over the world. Like there's, a, there's, they're yeah. all over the place to be honest. But there's, a, there's a lot of light that's being, I mean, the whole conflict right now, a lot of people speculate that Russia is invading over those bio labs specifically because they're U S affiliated, uh, you know, going back to, uh, uh, what is it? Black and Veatch and, uh, Southern, uh, what was it? It's been a while since I've gotten through this, but Southern, there's a company here in the U S that's building these labs over there, Black and Veatch and oh God, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but anyways, um, it, it's, it's ironic that 2014, this plane allegedly gets shot down and somebody <laughs> in the chat was saying that there's some conspiracy stuff around it, bodies that were found that shouldn't have been there. Um, you know, a bunch of Dutch nationals, 196 Dutch nationals on a flight from, I that's don't know if it was shot. Cause that, it, that's an NXP is out of, a, it were, is a Dutch company. So NXP is the one that bought freelance semiconductor is a Dutch company. So I'd like to know what those Dutch nationals actually did yeah, or were involved in, to be yeah, honest. Read it real quick. Now I, I can dive into Ukraine if you want, but people are going to probably get pissed off at me. Do you want me to real quick or no? Well, hold on, hold on. Let me just read this first while, because I, I want to make sure that I'm given good information. And I just read a, a, a caption. So it says, on July 17th, 2014, Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 was brought down over eastern Ukraine. The flight was on its way from Amsterdam to Kalua Lumpur. Lump, Lumpur. So, okay, so it didn't originate in Ukraine. And uh, I think you told me that earlier. Yeah. On board were 283 passengers, 15 crew members. Among the passengers were 196 Dutch nationals. In the aftermath, the government set three priorities, repatriating and identifying victims, establishing the cause of the crash, and conducting a criminal investigation. And, uh, okay, so that's that's the gist there. So it just got shot down over eastern Ukraine. Yeah, I might look into that, too, because if there was Dutch, I'd like to see if there was, because that was the company that also that ended up purchasing Freelance was a Dutch company. Um, yeah. NXP for that with that merger. Okay, well, I mean, if it was coming out of Amsterdam, it wouldn't be that strange that you know there's Dutch. On yeah, there. that's what I'm saying. So if it's just normal Dutch people, that's fine. But if it's okay, we have a bunch of Dutch semiconductor people on here. Okay, what's going? You know what I mean? So, I don't yeah, know. I and, there, and there might not. Like I said, I did this. You know, specifically. Like I said, I, I I'm a, I'm Sage Outcast on YouTube, right? That's my show, and I'm starting a, a project Outcatch, which is basically I'm going to look into conspiracies and things like that and get receipts. I'm just going to show. I want to show the receipts, the proof. Now with Ukraine, um, un- Ukraine is an important aspect for our country. We really need to keep Ukraine. Uh, I now I understand people are like you're going to piss off a lot of people. I know, that. but this and this is what I from an aspect of like I said, this is. I got 20 years in logistics. I, this is what I do for a living. Probably more than that. Uh, analysis and everything else. So Ukraine is the breadbasket of the East. They provide food. They, I mean, it's a big deal. The United States' main export was right now is natural gas right now and um, food. We export food. We're basically exporting food, and Ukraine is also producing food over there. If Ukraine were to be lost to Russia, let's just say they took over Ukraine, they now gain the breadbasket food. And when it comes to war, all that matters is energy. Food energy, fuel energy, oil energy, all that matters is energy in war. Okay, Nothing else matters. So if Russia were to come in and say, now they're taking over Ukraine and they're in charge of Ukraine, now hear me out, they would now gain the breadbasket and, and a hell of a lot of energy f- to, for their people and, and China's to also have more, right? So they're gaining that food because we're obviously going to cut back. 
Where are they going to get their food energy to fight us? Well, they want Ukraine. They want these, this, this area for that food. So what it also does is Egypt buys a lot of food from, let's say, Ukraine. They buy their grains and think countries like that, right? And they're part of the UN. Well, if, we, if Ukraine's not giving them, not trading with Egypt, then the United States has to basically kick up and provide more food to Egypt. But that raises the cost to Egypt. It causes food inflation in Egypt, which is a problem because we have to ship it from the United States over to there. So if Russia comes in and takes over Ukraine, they can go to places like Egypt. I'm just using them as an example, but all Middle East you know, area. They can go in there and say, look, you want to buy from the United States for $10 a bag, or do you want to buy for us for $1 a bag? Which do you want to buy? Well, they're going to have to feed their country, so they're going to weigh that $1 a bag because that's what they can afford, and they don't want to crush their own country because of this. Well, if you want, if you, Russia can then say, well, if you want our $1 bag, you got to vote with us in UN and, and deals. Next time we have this UN stuff, you're going to vote with us. So they start to gain leverage. They start to give leverage over the East if they take Ukraine. Now, Richard Cranium, the president of Ukraine, knows this. He knows it. He knows that he's got us by the balls. So he's ganking all this money because he knows it. If we go into Ukraine, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's war. If we put people, our forces in Ukraine, it's basically war. He's literally playing the dumbest people in office. Now, if it was Trump, Trump's a negotiator, a business person. And, I, I, and he could probably come in and say, bro, boy, you ain't playing me. <laughs> you ain't playing me. But he's not. So it, it, we need Ukraine, but unfortunately, the dude in charge of Ukraine knows this shit and is right. ganking the hell out of it. Now, we are selling them this stuff. They're going to pay us back later, allegedly. Um, but that's everybody says, yeah, I'll, pay you, I'll, I'll gladly pay you tomorrow for a hamburger today. But we're mm -hmm. also getting an opportunity to test some of our technology in real live co conflict, Right. So it is a benefit for us, but the problem is, is the guy in charge of Ukraine knows the importance he has, and there's nothing we can do about it, and he's gone on stage, he's a comedian, right, and comedians are kind of actors, he's gone on the, the, the big scale of the, the planet and played his role to the point that it's like, you, you, you got us, you little bastard. You little bastard, there's nothing we can do now to make you look bad. But unfortunately, we do need Ukraine. We need, that, we need the bread basket of the East because by holding that, it slows down possible conflict and war with China and Russia, and it also allows cheaper grains and things to be sold to Middle East countries that will vote our way because Ukraine's with us. Does that make sense? Yep. So I know people aren't, you know, some people are going to disagree with it, but trust me, think about it. It's the bread basket of the East. Why is it that? How much food are they shipping out? How important is that? And well, fertilizer as well. And so fertilizer. Even, even the food aspect of it doesn't affect the United States so much, but uh, it does, the fertilizer aspect absolutely affects us, which in turn will affect our food. Correct. Uh, costs over here. We haven't even begun to feel no. uh, the effect. The yes, of that. correct. And so if Russia were to take this, the, the fertilizer and breadbasket of the East, is that good for us or bad for us? Well, it's bad. And unfortunately, the dude in charge of Ukraine knows it and is yeah. now playing. He's playing. He, 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 look, man, he has an opportunity to soak up as much cash. It, it's unbelievable. <laughs> and well, and he has a lot of leverage over our current administration. Yes. I mean, yes. There's no question about that. And he's he using it. Oh, yeah. Because if it wasn't that important, why would we be doing it? It's, he's right. using the leverage, and he knows it. And he's playing the, the political stage, and he's playing the world stage to use that leverage. And he's doing it. So it is very important we keep it. We should be there, unfortunately. But the people in charge of this administration are not handling him properly. They're not, right. they're not running it like a business and going in there and saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> You know, and I, do I know how it should be played? I don't. That's not my job. I just know the the logistical importance of Ukraine, 
and how it, if, if Ukraine were to be lost, who would gain it and what power would that now give Russia and China? And it would give them fertilizer and the breadbasket of the East, which is basically energy, food energy, to fight. And when you got a billion people in, in just China alone and you want to take on the United States, you're going to have to feed them. And our main export is food and right now natural gas. Service. Um, <laughs> right. We're a service-based economy. Right. Come on. It's, and buying yeah, things. Yeah, we got some natural gas and we, we have tons of resources. Yeah. We just, we're, not, we're not using them because, you know, we got to make sure we keep the carbon out of the air. Yeah, and that's another reason we don't do semiconductors because making semiconductors is actually pretty dirty. So the fact that, you know, it, 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 you got to go through a lot of restrictions and stuff like that. Now, I believe that if you're going to bring any manufacturing here, you better be bringing technology manufacturing. You better be bringing semiconductors back here. Do I believe in electric cars? Um, I don't, but I believe in the push for that technology of the, of, the, of the semiconductors and the information that's inside the cars. But if you want to have an electric car, great. Let yourself drive an electric car. Are you going to mandate it for everybody? I think it's such a hard push because that brings so much money in. Smart people are hoping to come here and make the technology and the chips and the semiconductors. Because if you, the, one of the important things about the car is you have to have a quantum style computer in it because it has to react quickly to changes on the road. Yep. So that is the technology that is what we are trying to, to get to is that fast acting technology of quantum computing and automobiles and tractor trailers would be a small aspect of that because road conditions are constantly changing with cars. You need computers that are like bam, 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 that understands exactly how to handle that. That's an aspect of quantum computing that I believe the reason we're pushing so hard is it brings in the people to, to make that technology. And, I, and, 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 and just to be clear, I don't think you're insinuating that, that the car itself has a quantum computer, but the car is able to transmit data to yes. a cloud, which is the quantum. Which is the quantum. Computer. And IBM in 2016 um, actually started to do quantum uh, cloud computing. So right. they already have some quantum computing in the clouds um, as of 2016. So no, the car right. wouldn't have it. It's the, the ability to relay the information to the quantum computer and back is the better, is no, we, that we need to have. And those semiconductors, now those are the semiconductors that freelance, free scale build because they're in the cars and they're able to catch that information that fast. Yeah. And then what people you know, don't understand about smart cars is like you, you have these Teslas out there on the road and, and you know, every single Tesla is learning from every other Tesla. So while that car is driving around, and most most electric cars, if it has especially if it has autopilot, if it has autopilot, every single mile you drive, it's learning. It's learning about the road conditions. It's learning what people do when they uh, come to a crosswalk. It's learning. Uh, it, it really is fascinating. I mean, right. it's it's to be honest with you, it's at the point now. There are going to be certain you know things that come up that a, a computer might not be able to respond the same way that a human being might, but you know, it's just going to get smarter and smarter. And, uh, you know, if, if you think about it, these quantum computers that are controlling these cars, and this is every facet of your life. Uh, and I'm just speaking about cars exclusively here, but cars, uh, the, 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 the cloud computing that's behind the driver for the, that's the driver for the Tesla autopilot right. had trillions of miles logged in as experience, which is more than any single human being by a monstrous number. Right. And, and so uh, there, there will come a time, if we're not there already, where an autopilot Tesla is infinitely safer than a human being driving. Correct. And I just want to make sure everybody understands, when, when we're talking about quantum computing, I know right now there are far aspects of, of you know, people on the right there, by quantum computers and all this other stuff, but an actual quantum computer is real. And what it does is, rather, like I said, I explained this in the beginning. You can go back. I'll do it real quick. Rather than have regular bits, ones and zeros, in the computer, you have qubits. And a qubit is both a one and a zero at the same time. And it also has uh, particle entanglement, which is what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. So what? Ha no, it's what, just what he called it. And because at, it can be no matter where it is, if this one's spinning clockwise, this one automatically spins counterclockwise. And they've actually run tests to see 
if it's it's not like okay, well, I have a red ball and a green ball. So if I open up this box and it's a red ball, I know that one's a green ball. No, they've actually run tests that this one will literally change. This one is once we detect this one, this one literally does the opposite, and they've done tests that it's sending information information faster than the speed of light. So what a qubit can do is you need ones and zeros to process data. That's how computers work. But if a qubit is literally doubled and can be a one and a zero at the same time, you are literally have 16,000 bits is equal to 10 qubits. That's insane. I mean, and that's, so the process, it, it goes immensely faster, and, but it, it's not going to help people I mean, this isn't med bed situations or, you know, you know, this type of stuff. This is a legit computer that does calculations faster than anything we can ever imagine. It's not going to help me play video games right now. But what it can do is calculate medical stuff, weather, financial stuff, and that type of data, and also help machine learning, help computers learn at a pace that they... 24-7, 365, at a million miles an hour, they, could learn, they can learn absolutely everything. And not only the past, but the future. And yeah. that's what quantum computing technically is. And it's something that it's already here on, on higher levels of cloud. And it's, it's not going away. Yeah, one of the, one of the craziest things that, that, and this is what makes it fun, <laughs> Uh, with and fun is a, is a really kind of a shitty term to be honest with you, um, but in in the book I was that I read, uh, once AI gets to a certain level, once it passes AGI, artificial general intelligence, which means it's smarter than humans, um, it'll eventually hit ASI, which is artificial super intelligence. At that point, it's billions of times smarter than a human being. Right. And when it gets to that level. Um, he says explicitly that uh, your analysis of what AI is going to be capable of is no different than his, even though right now he's infinitely smarter than us. Like he knows more about, Correct. like he could write the code for it, but because it's going to be on a level that we can't comprehend. And so you can think about, you know, what, what a, a supercomputer that is a billion times smarter than a human. And there's going to be numerous ones. It's not like it's just one computer. Correct. And they're all going to be connected, by the way. Th that's the craziest thing. Like anything that's connected to the internet and connected to the cloud is going to be able to connect and, and interact with one another. Correct. And uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty much going to create a whole nother species. Uh, you know, we are going to see in our lifetime, in our lifetime, we are going to see artificial intelligence as a superior species to human beings. Machines are going to surpass human beings as the most dominant force on this planet. The only thing that makes human beings uh, relevant and, 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 you know, the apex predator is our logic and our ability to rationalize and think and communicate. Uh, if we don't have those things, then we're no different than, and we're actually a lot less different. A dog yes. would destroy a human being. Uh, well, maybe not a dog, but, you know, you think of a lion, a tiger, bears. Correct. Large animals, uh, yeah. Yeah. We, they, they destroy us. What makes us better is we can make a weapon. We can develop the gun, the gunpowder. Correct. Um, and so we're going to get to a point where artificial intelligence is going to look at human beings and say, uh, you guys are actually um, detrimental to Earth, especially considering who's programming them, these green globalist freaks. Yeah. You guys are detrimental to Earth, uh, not because of your carbon, but because you are stripping the earth of all of its resources. Mm -hmm. It's not sustainable and all this other stuff. And it could decide to go a completely different direction. Have you ever watched Rick and Morty, Sage? Yeah, a couple times. Yep. Okay. You ever see like one of the very first episodes? I think it's the second episode, actually. Uh, his dog. He puts a, he pees on the floor. And uh, he says, can you, Rick, who's a, you know, scientist, genius scientist, right. invented portals and everything else. Yeah. And he says to him, can you make something to stop the dog from pissing on the floor? And he puts his helmet on the dog. And the dog, like, at that point can speak. It, it learns to talk. No, I didn't and see so this the one. dog, what's that? I didn't see this one. Oh, you got to watch it. It's the second episode. Okay. And so the dog looks in the mirror and sees there's a panel on the helmet. And he opens the panel and realizes that if he puts more batteries in it, it gets stronger and stronger. And so it's, you know, that's the equivalent of AI Correct. being able to, you know, update. And it gets to the point where the dog becomes smarter than man creates a whole society duplicates the helmet creates a, a a world where dogs 
are are more uh, intellectual than humans, mm. and eventually they negotiate a deal where the dogs leave and go to another planet. But uh, which would be absolutely awful, by the way, if we lost all of our dogs. That yeah. would break my heart. <laughs> I, I, well, um, I, I'm running Maine Coon cats. You, if you ever want a cat that's like a dog, get a Maine Coon. Just so you yeah. know. Yeah. And they're huge. Anyways, I, I just thought that was really funny. You should probably watch that episode. You So you got to watch that episode of Rick and Morty. You got to watch Heart of Stone. Heart of Stone. And you got and you got to read Scary Smart. Now, when you read Scary Smart, you only have to read the first half of the book. The second half of the book is pretty much irrelevant. So and it's all it's it's a really fascinating. Well, what was the movie? Uh, Heart of Stone. OK. And then, of course, you can watch Manifest because of MH370. Yeah, I think I think that one. But no. I, and look, man, I know a lot of people are like, he's not he's not. But, dude, I, I'm not telling you anything that doesn't. Yes. Like somebody said, oh, he says faster than the speed of light. Yes. They actually measured the transfer rate between two entangled particles. And it was faster than the speed of light. That's a fact. You're welcome to Google it. You're welcome to uh, uh, shoot me an email. I'll send you the link. Uh, and you can w- we can watch it together if you ever want. I have no problem backing up my information 100%. But that's these, the, like I said, these computers, it's, it, it, I'm telling you that th- there just seems to be a lot. Uh, it, it's doom if, if it goes into the wrong thing. So. This is, I do believe that this was the reason for the, the COVID um, to try to slow that down and slow down the impact of China being able to, because remember, other countries shut down. So China, it also stopped China from going into other countries and getting this technology. And it stopped people, from, it was supposed to stop people from bringing in products to China so that China could produce this. And it didn't stop China. The country literally let this one operate and shut everything else down. I mean, I just I I do want to add just because he thinks that that's the the basis for or the reasoning behind COVID. That doesn't mean that there weren't ulterior motives. Oh, absolutely. You know, the the mail in ballots, 100 percent, you know, 100 percent that that was there. Oh, I mean, Uh, think about it. It's a perfect time to release it. It's take advantage of the crisis, which they did. So they you they knew that this I mean, if you think about it, it, to me, it fits because you knew you were doing this here. So you knew what the effects that you could do with it over here. Right. You knew that. Well, if it's if it goes there, well, here's what we're going to do over there. And here's what we're going to use it for over here. It was multi-purposed. I mean, COVID was be able to take out hopefully China, and take you know put all do everything they did to us. I mean, if again, if I was in charge, <laughs> I probably would have did the same thing. If I, 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 you know, basing this on devil's advocate, like if you ever want somebody to be on your show to be devil's advocate, you know, like I, me and Cam Con talked, I'm like I sometimes I feel like the blonde girl on the View, right? It's just it's just anti View, right? So uh, if you ever wanted somebody to be that guy, I'm that guy because if I was evil and I wanted to take out China and put our country into position that I want to put them in with COVID, COVID was brilliant. It it it, it took down China, it locked down countries, it gave me the ability to sell my vaccine to other countries so they were dependent on me. It, it literally locked us down. It made us all sit down in front of the computer and basically hate each other. Bro, it, listen, it, I have a serious problem with individualism, okay? And, and we are, if, you, if everybody has individualism, it, it's, it's easier to, be, to become a communist country. If nobody, does that make sense? If you have an individual, like, when it comes to, oh God, here we go. I'm gonna piss everybody off. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> Let's. I do not feel okay. Transgenderism. I will not listen. If you want me to call you by, you know, you have to call me by my pronoun. Fine, dickhead. I don't have to call you anything. I'm not. I can. You know. I don't care. Just make my sandwich. I don't give a crap. Right. If I'm at Subway and I had some, you know, excuse me, sir, don't put that. Oh, I'm a man. I don't give a shit who you are. I'm paying you. Put the damn thing the way I want. I'll, it does. I'll call you whatever I want. That's my. Why would you piss somebody off in on my? Because I can I watch them. Because I can watch them. Right. Either way. Oh. Well, so I don't believe you should. Some people are like, well, if you want to wear a dress, that's up to you. That's fine. As long as it doesn't affect me. But I don't feel you should be able to, because what you're what once you do that, you're causing individualism, right? And we don't want that. We want communities, because communities build stronger 
and it's less conquer and divide. So when people are like, well, why can't he wear a dress? That's his business. That's his right. Because he's in my community. And I can't walk naked through the kids' park because we as a community has decided that, one, that would be not a pretty sight. But two, that would be not something that people, we allow, right? There's no way they're going to let you and your wife walk naked through the kids' park and jump on the monkey bars. It's just, it, as a community, we've decided that that was inappropriate, and to com keep our community a community, that's an important factor. So to me, when people start to say, it's okay, he can wear a dress, or he can dress, it's not, because you're breaking the community and creating individualism. And that individual is a slow takedown it, of, of this country. I, do, if you guys look up the 19, um, back in 1929, before the, this is why I also know that there's probably going to be a stock market crash and we're, we're working towards a Great Depression is, in the 1929 Great Depression, we had this same back and forth. Like Dem because the, remember, the New Deal was coming. And the New Deal, Republicans and Democrats were fighting over the New Deal. Well, we're fighting over the Build Back Better. All we're missing is our depression. Is that what we're heading for? I mean, is that what, you know what I mean? Because we already have the animosity. We already have the money problem. We already have everything that the 1929 era had. We just allegedly are not in a recession, and we're allegedly not heading for a depression. But are we? I think we are. So there's a lot of other aspects, too, that, look, man, I'm a rabbit hole person. I dive down rabbit holes to the point where it's like, Jesus Christ, I need a longer shovel. Um, but <laughs> either way. I have no problem. Like I said, if you wanted, if you wanted someone to come on the show, that you know, you got to have the the, the 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 devil's advocate. That's me sometimes. I'm just, All right, let me uh, let me run through some. Uh, got a couple rumble rants here to get through, uh, and then we'll we'll start wrapping this up. Uh, Colmar two thousand says, "Let's effing go." All right, I've been hyped for this show. So there you go. I've been talking about it, plugging it a little bit here and there, and some some shows. Denise Ann, too, says silver is much better than gold. I've never liked the look of gold. Yeah, silver's got more uh, industrial use. Industrial silver is uh, far more useful than gold. And so I've always been a fan of, of silver. I do have a little bit of gold, um, but I have most of my physical uh, mineral, my physical, you wouldn't call it a mineral. Yeah, I guess you would. Yeah, it's, it, uh, it actually is. Yeah, Commodities. Yeah. So, if you want. Yeah, my physical commodities are are silver mainly. Uh, Nicole, Nicole, holy bear. Thanks for becoming a monthly supporter. Appreciate that. Uh, Denise Ann says, I think the safety aspect sounds good, but the thought of giving up control to a machine is terrifying. It really is. Um, that is absolutely terrifying. If you read again, if you read that book, I, I just talked about scary smart. And if you want to read the whole thing, it'll give you a little bit of hope. It's a little scary because it it's something I'm torn on if you read the book because he kind of pictures this utopian society, which to me sounds really like you will own nothing and be perfectly happy. But when you think, when, when you hear the way that he's able to talk about it with the, with the aid of artificial intelligence, uh, you know, basically guiding this, uh, it, I mean, it sounds nice, but the whole, the American dream is this drive which humans have to have drive we have to have something to motivate mm -hmm. us and inspire us and give us reasoning for waking up and it seems like it would take that away because everybody would be on a similar level not the same level necessarily but a similar level and to me i mean at, at that point like and, and this is something with ai like we we have Neuralink coming out right uh, yeah. Elon Musk, I think, just got the approval. And they're, you know, they're saying now they say that, um, you know, it's just to help uh, paraplegics and quadriplegics function and use, para, you know, paralyzed people use their limbs again. And sure. and they always kind of do it on something like that, something that's promising and something that's, oh, yeah, it's for the good of everybody, you know. And when you think about this, when Neuralink is widely available and, you know, the elites start putting it in their heads and they have this connectivity to the cloud and to artificial intelligence that is going to be able to uh, manipulate their brain, essentially take control of their brain. You will be able to access information just by thinking about it. You know, right. you can think about what is, uh, you know, think of some, uh, you know, crazy physics calculation and, and you're not a physicist. 
but you'll know exactly what it is and you'll Correct. know everything about it because that Neuralink is going to be able to upload all that into your brain instantly. And everybody's going to say, you know, I, I, especially my listeners, myself included, oh, hell no, you ain't putting anything in my brain. But you're going to be such at, at such a disadvantage in society at that point that you, you won't be able to compete in any way, shape or form. Yeah. At that point, you will be nothing more than a slave to those who have that capability. Correct. So, yeah. So it's almost like, and, and at that point, the really scary thing about this, and this is my prophecy uh, that I've come up with. And uh, at that point, everybody's going to have to get Neuralink or mm -hmm. some sort of a, a, of an uplink. Um, and this is transhumanism 101. And it's fucking terrifying, man. And you, I mean, you could get to the point Sage where AI runs the world, a singularity, like, you know, uh, again, another uh, Rick and Morty episode where he right. goes to visit, uh, where he goes to visit the singular chick, uh, or the uh, the hive mentality, the hive mind. But think about it this way, man: like you and I, Sage, could have the Neuralink, and our day to day is going out and digging holes looking for cobalt, whatever it may be. Right. But because Neuralink is in our brain, just like that, you're in the Matrix, and you and I are fine dining on the top of uh, correct, you know mount everest or something like that and to us it's the realest thing that could ever happen and meanwhile the hive mind of ai is using our bodies as a vessel to like do like all the day-to-day -day stuff and again i could be way off on this but like mogadot said when ai gets to super intelligence my guess is as good as yours so you can ridicule me and say i'm dumb or whatever but one of the smartest people in this field is saying that you're exactly right or not that you're exactly right, but that you absolutely could be exactly right. Nobody knows. So right. just want and, to throw and, that out. And, and I could do a whole show and like, I know real quick, cause I know you have a couple other people that are paying and I want to answer the one, $2 one. But if you, if, what people need to understand about gold and silver at one point, seashells was money. Right, mm -hmm. seashells. So all money is all money is doesn't matter if it's gold and silver, is storage of energy. A dollar bill is nothing more than stored energy. I will give I I used my energy to make this, and I will give you this for you to use your energy to mow my lawn. It's yep. stored energy. So money's on a progression. It's on a progression from from you know seashells to whatever else they used. I'm, I I'll have, I can do a video on it and put it all together and research it to gold and silver. But gold and silver has to be melted down, so it's not the most efficient storing of money, correct? Because you have to melt it down to process it to put it over to use it. Well, of the dollar, the next thing that basically became money was the dollar bill, and the dollar bill was easier to print, but it's still not as, as efficient, right? And then you have credit cards where I don't have to make a whole bunch of dollars. I can just give you one credit card or one debit card. So that's a little bit more efficient. And then people started using their phones, and that's even more efficient. Eventually, you'll get some tag in your wrist or tag in your hand or on your arm, and that would be more efficient. But the ultimate efficiency of money would be batteries. Batteries would be the ultimate efficient way to exchange energy. And that's the push towards battery technology because now you're talking central bank digital currency with batteries as your stored energy, and, and that's it. You're done. You no longer, it's the most optimal way to exchange energy is batteries. I can do a video on that with you too if you want. It reminds me of what's, what was the movie, Night and Day? Is that what it was? No. Is that what it is? Cruise movie where like the whole movie is based on this one like double A size battery that could control like a whole city. Yes. Power a whole city. Because that's eventually what technically money and everything is. is what, when you break it down, everything we do is energy. It needs energy. We need food energy. We need electricity energy. We need energy. And food's converted to energy. And so when you, you want the most efficient way to hold energy, it's batteries. You want the most efficient way to exchange energy? It's batteries. Not yeah. money, not silver, not gold. And we're not going to the past. We're moving to the future. And we're moving to the most efficient way to exchange energy. And yep. that's what all money is. All right, let's jump back in here. Gail Time says, nice debate, CanCon. Press him on who's pulling the strings behind the curtain. Um, I'm not there yet. I, I'm working. I'm, I, I, I had to figure out the why. Before I could, you know, follow the money, 
right? So now, since I've got what I believe to be the why with enough, I believe enough to connect the dots. So some people will be like, no, I'm not there yet, and that's okay. But now I at least, from now, I say, okay, here's where I'm at. Now I can follow the money to connect it to the why, right? I'm just, I'm just going backwards with it. Rather than starting with the money, I'm starting with why and working the money. Well, and, th and this is, a, this will be a really difficult why, because it's not necessarily, you know, um, it, it likely in, on the U S side, it likely is the globalist, but, yes. but how do you define the globalist? That's such a broad term. It's right. going to be the big tech firms like Google, like Amazon, um, you Correct. know, that are, that are developing artificial intelligence at the cyclic rate. Um, and, and as you start the... to see Dempsey, when he sold Twitter, he went to Africa. Right. Right. So you're. Africa's the money. Africa's the new customer. Africa's the one they want to replace us, our purchasing, and, and provide ability for Africa to be able to start buying things and employing people and putting plants in so people have money so they become the big spenders. And yeah, remember that... Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Big spenders to us it just means that they buy a lot. Now, they might be buying sneakers for on Timu for $20, where we're buying them on Amazon for 50 or whatever. I don't know, right? Uh, but it's still they're spending money which gives employment to China. And Africa, China's looking at Africa as they're gonna, and looks at them and says, they're going to save us. The United States is against us. We need a new customer. And they're, BRICS, like I said, that's why they're not going to do a gold-backed currency because you don't want that because we have gold. The United States has right. gold. You want a currency we don't have. And that's why I believe there's a massive rush for that, like the Mountain Pass mine to start rare earth mineral mining because we don't have it. We trust China to have it. And I have a chart. Hang on. Let me pull this up. While you're pulling that up, we, I mean, it's guys, up. just research it yourself. There, there is a massive push by both the United States and China to, uh, you know, to, to, to basically colonize Africa for, the, for those resources. Go ahead. Right. What is this? So this this one is uh, this one is pant patents granted by origin of country, computer technology China. Whoa. I mean this is this all right here China U.S. Uh, this one is rare earth minerals China, Brazil, Russia, Canada. You see U.S. right here. Does anybody see where my mouse is? Right <laughs> here. That's that U.S., that little sliver. Brazil, BRICS, Russia is in BRICS, China is in BRICS, India is in BRICS. Why would you go with gold when you could basically be diving into th this rare earth minerals like cobalt and lithium and, and some of the other stuff, so I'm not even going to try to so pronounce. Can you, can you zoom in on that? I can. Uh, I think this, this map right here, you know, just hit control and roll your mouse oh, ball that way. I run a yeah, Mac. Just, oh, oh, damn you Mac users. Yeah. So look at this map right here. And I mean, this is probably the greatest argument <laughs> for what you're saying about creating a currency that's backed by other minerals outside of gold. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, look at that. The blue is Brazil. Yeah. Because the blue bricks right here. The R is Russia. Scroll up a little bit. The R is Russia. Yeah. Which right is here. The green. The I is India. Yep. The C is China. Yeah. The only one, the only one that's got a lot of resources that's not mentioned is Vietnam. Correct. <laughs> and right here is U.S. and Canada. Right down here. And it's like point seven percent. After mine production, rare earth minerals must be refined and separated into individual metals for their use in magnets, lights, screens, glass, batteries, alloy steels. I mean. China, woo, right here, <laughs> 140,000 tons of, chi of that. Bro, that is a terrifying graph right there. And that I understand, like I said, and this is the patent one, which, oh, hang on. I can, oh, can I plus in this one? Yeah, I can. I mean, this is right here is just the patents for technology is, is they're, they're crushing us. Was that was that where the, the earth minerals, was that what we are pulling out or is that what we have? That's that's what they have. That's because it says that they have 140,000 tons. Where is that one? Let me bring it back. 140,000, but it's probably scaled for billions or millions. Yeah. Yeah, something like probably scaled way up there. Let me see what it is. Oh, hang on. 
it's got to say like in the millions. Mine production. This was 2020, and this right here. Now, rare earth minerals. That's still 140,000 tons of rare earth minerals. Monstrous. That's a lot. Okay, but it does say production, so that means that that's what production. they're producing. Right. So that doesn't necessarily mean that that's. Scroll up to the top and let's see what it says. Okay, let me go like this. Where in the world are all the rare earth minerals? And that chart is rare earth elements are a group of 17 elements whose importance is critical in high technology. Okay, scroll down and see if it says, uh, wait, rare earth, rare earths are abundant in the earth's crust, but mineable concentrations are less common, making reserves potentially very valuable and strategic. The USGS tracked the world's reserve in tons, imperial. Um, and then it says, where are yeah. the world's reserves? Okay, so that I, it looks like the chart might be how much is available and then the one down there is just the production yeah I, it, it just it, the, they're pumping it out like it, that's crazy we just we just put in a mine and i got to uh, there's a phd guy that i deal with um he and i've consult i've done consulting for the epoch times i've done consulting for uh freight waves i've interviewed uh Rebecca Koffler from Putin's Playbook. I've interviewed Shi Van Fleet. She was interviewed by Tucker Carlson. Um, and I interviewed, the, there's a doctor who writes for the Epoch Times, uh, Dr. Antonio Graceffo, and he, he's in Mongolia, and he has a PhD, and he studies uh, Chinese economics. And he is 100%, uh, I'm hoping to get him on your show, he's, 100, he's you know, super for Trump, and, and, and he basically can't stand China, and he writes books about what how, this is very bad with China and this is the control aspect of it. And he says the same thing about, like I said, with gold, it's, it's, there's not enough, you know, at some point there's not enough, like we're a monstrous economy in the world now, right? That it, to cover all, the United, all countries to use a gold-backed currency. Well, what ha, like I said, right now, I think we're also, I think. Oh, no, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. They don't use a gold-backed currency. They use a U.S. dollar-backed currency. Right, no, no, and that's what I'm saying. Like, if to use a gold-backed currency, it would be almost impossible because the, right. the, the size, right, to, of that. And, and I do believe, too. And the other thing, too, is people are like, well, the petrodollar is going with Saudi Arabia. We're not on the petrodollar. We're not on that. I mean, it is traded with that. But the main importance, the main reason people back the U.S. dollar is, one, we, we have a country that is somewhat stable. We, we don't just, we, like China, if they want to turn off money, they can turn it off tomorrow. There's nothing you can do. We have a process in which we have to go through. Two, we pay our debts. Three, we do, well, obviously we do have a military that's going to come in and assist you, right? But we're not at war. Like a country, nobody's coming in like tomorrow. The United States could back Ukraine so much that we go into Ru or or guess what? The Wagner Group decides that they're pissed off that their president died and there's a revolution in in Russia, and the United States goes in. Now the ruble is no longer the ruble. That's unlikely to happen here in the United States. All other countries are going to fall before the United States does. Right? Is the hope, unless you're doing it like China's doing it, which is real sneaky and pretty Terrible. damn good. Yeah. Yeah. So the last place you're going to put your, the last place you want to hold is U.S. dollars, because if that one crumbles, everybody else is gone anyways. Yeah. Right. Let me uh, let me new kid here says you should go down the Ukraine corruption rabbit hole. Move on from a shovel to a pickaxe. You oh. need a, bull, a, a backhoe. Jesus at that Christ. Point. At that point. Yeah. Um, new kid says not sure how anyone who's well researched can say that American cabal should retain control of Ukraine. Uh, the the problem is is like I said, right? Let's let's put it in a small aspect. You live in a city and you are getting all of your food from this one farm. This one farm goes under and gets taken over by China, and they no longer sell you food to your town. They're outsourcing it to their country. The only place you can now get food is from another town that's 100 miles away. And it's going to cost you a lot more to get that food delivered to you. How important was that farm to you? How important was that farm? It was monstrously important because your food went from $1 a dollar a, a bundle to $10 a bundle because you're now getting food from a town 100 miles away and it has to be delivered by truck. So if we lose Ukraine and it falls under Russia, 
they now control the farm. And the only place for them to get the food is an ocean away. That's the importance of Ukraine. So the only thing that I'll say to this, and this is why I, your, your, your theory on Ukraine is, is exactly right. If Ukraine uh, fell under Russian control, then, mm -hmm. I mean, that would be a disastrous, uh, you know, for, for all of Europe, pretty much. Correct. And, and the Middle East. Uh, well, not so much the Middle East, but more Europe. More Europe, there, yeah. A, a lot of Middle East countries are trying to join into BRICS. In fact, I think the UAE and the Saudis just uh, were invited in f a, a formally. Um, the, the thing that my, concerns me is I don't think this war in Ukraine is over the food. I don't think Russia is going to uh, try and occupy all of Ukraine because if they did, then that would put Russia on a border of a NATO nation. And Ukraine, it literally, if you translate the, the, the name Ukraine, it stands for borderlands or, or uh, bu yeah, borderland. And it's, it, it's a buffer between nato and Correct. russia in that regard but, so i i tend to take russia more at face value when they say that we're not interested in all of ukraine we just want the the don the donetsk and the the luhansk regions uh much like they did with crimea where they needed access to that to that warm water port right uh, in the black because that's the start and, you need to control those listen it's not a, a quick process they're already stealing ships now right they're already stealing grain now they're stealing it right but it's a slow process to get to those ports because once you control the ports, you control the flow of the food. Yeah, see this, but this is this is where you need a negotiator like Trump that's not bought off, bought and paid for yes. in Ukraine. Doesn't have conflict right. in Ukraine because Trump can come in and say, "Look, we're gonna." And, and this is something that Elon Musk proposed on Twitter uh, several months back and got blasted by the mm -hmm. the neocon fucktards like Lindsey Graham. <laughs> I, I got no other word for him. He's a fucktard. Um, this is where he got blasted. And he said, let's let's have a, a, a referendum, an election mm -hmm. in the eastern Ukrainian regions. If they vote to be annexed by Russia the same way Crimea did in 2014, if they vote for that and the UN, Russia, both, you know, Russia's part of the UN, they're overseeing the election, then, then it's settled. It's settled. But this is where somebody like Trump comes in and says, uh, in the f famous words of, I, I can never fucking remember, sorry, language. I can never remember who it was that said this, but not an inch further in, in regards to NATO. I think right. it was under the Bush administration. Um, but anyways, wh whoever it was, it wasn't Kissinger. I'm trying to remember who the hell it was that said that. Not not one more inch. That is where you need a negotiator like Trump to say, hey, if, if Eastern Ukraine decides to become Russian because they're pretty much ethnic Russians already, then so be it. However, um, one inch further than that, and you will feel the full for force of NATO. We will. Yeah, intervene. but even if they take, let's think about this. If they take those regions, they're on a NATO country, aren't they? No. Well, Ukraine's not well, a NATO country. Aren't they letting them in? No, no, no. They've, they, they, they're they saying no. They're okay. saying absolutely not. So, and Zelensky is saying you have to let us in, and NATO. Yeah, saying he's no. playing that. Like I said, I, I understand the importance of the ports and the food and the distribution, right? And I think there's a lot of factors that they're using – but the, my, my opinion is the main goal is once you take the breadbasket of the East, you're, you're in control. you got leverage. And Zelensky, Richard Cranium, he knows this shit. He's not dumb. He's not dumb. He's playing it. He's playing his part. He's, he's playing us. Now, we, he knows the importance of it, but I do believe that if they truly wanted, I, I, I think Russia went in there. I thought, man, we could have whole shows on the Nord Stream 2. I did shows on Nord Stream 2. I mean, Russia strong does not like us. Russia literally does disinformation campaigns nonstop. They've been doing them forever. I mean, do you, do you remember the story of AIDS was created to take out homosexuals? And you, and, okay, you know that started in Russia, right? No, I did not Yes, that. there's a whole, okay, I did a whole video on this. I went down the rabbit hole that Russia started that story and you guys can look at this up. This is this all happened. There's there's videos on it. Russia started that, sent it to another country, where it eventually got back around, and it ended up on the front page of our of our news. Well, it got to the point that Reagan created a task force to look into this, and they tracked it back down to Russia. That R Reagan went to Gorbachev and said, "Stop this." He literally went to Russia and said, "This you did this. Stop it." Shut it down. And Gorbachev apologized for that. 
I'll send you the, I'll send you the, um, there's a YouTube uh, documentary that, that did it, and they, tra- and they follow the paper trail. I follow the paper trail also, because I, sec- I basically fact-checked the, this, and, and root, if you probably type in Ronald Reagan's AIDS task force or something, it'll probably pop up, that it was, it was literally created that. Um, I know, everybody's like, there's too many, too many errors in what Sage is saying. Well, then, let me show you, you want receipts, just email me. I'll email you the receipts. I'll email you the news links, the videos, whatever you want. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So how long until, uh, oh, somebody said, do you think Putin's goal is to take over and control the entirety of Ukraine? I, I do. I think, it, I think it, it's eventually he wants it. He's always said he wanted it. There's no doubt about that. He said he wants to put Russia back together. I, I do believe it. Now, can he, can he accomplish that? I don't know. But I believe if he had the power to, he absolutely would put the Soviet Union back together. 100%. Yeah, maybe, but I mean, he's been pretty clear. No, he so, hasn't. Again, yeah, no, he has. He's been very clear that he's not interested in occupying all of Ukraine. And, um, and you believe him? Because that's he, the problem. Okay. Do you believe them? Okay. Are, and are, are we any better, though? That's the other problem. If there's one thing I've learned, uh, we're equally as bad. Yeah, on- and, and the issue is, like, like I say this all the time to people, the goal of, there's a lot of time people are like, why are we in other countries? Why do we keep sending business to other countries, right? Now, I don't believe in going into China, but your goal, if you really want to do to, to spread capitalism, then you, you spread capitalism to other countries that have a like-minded knowledge of it, Korea, Vietnam, South Korea, not North Korea, uh, Vietnam, other countries that want to in want to take that type of in. You don't send it to China and think you're going to change China. So let's let's say Russia wants to rule the world, and you and and Putin wants to rule the world. Do you want to live under Russian? Do you want to live under a Russian regime? Well, I don't know that because the only per- perception I have of a Russian regime is what the Mockingbird media in the United States makes it out to be and do you want me to get same, do you want me to get rebecca koffler on for you because she I lived mean, in russia sure i'd love to have her on okay. uh by the same token um uh what's her name just went over there um jesus why can't i think of her name tara reed uh just uh denounced her u.s citizenship and took up russian citizenship thanks joe biden well um, there's also people that run into north korea I mean, people are nuts. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and some people... There's a lot of conspiracies about North Korea as well. Um, uh, we've it, actually it, flown in... Like, the people who taught my wife Korean, we have flown people in from Korea. Like, people... I have put yeah. people on a plane and flown them in. Um, and the, the issue with North Korea is North Korea truly is the way they are. They, it's a divided country that brothers ended up having to fight each other and, and split a country. Like, they... South Korea wants North Korea to become... To this way, but North Korea is not a legitimately from Korean people who were in my yeah. house. It's not. It is. It's not a good place to live. Yeah, but think about this. Think about this. Now, I'm not saying North Korea is good. I think okay. of all the places, I think it's pretty clear that North Korea is a is a uh, a, a dictatorship, a, a, com- a communist hellhole. But think about this. Um, mm-hmm. If you're in, say, Russia, and you have somebody like Tara Reid that comes over there, or say you mm-hmm. have somebody that is living on the streets in Detroit or mm-hmm. in San Francisco and they go over to Russia and they talk to Russian news and they say, what's it like over in, in America? Oh, well, you know, there's, it's lawlessness. People can just go in and rob stores and they're breaking hundreds of thousands of dollars and people are taking shits in the street. And, uh, you know, doctors are mutilating the well, genitals. Of you children. wouldn't be like, able to do this if you lived in Russia. Oh, sure. There's Russian people that have social media. There, no, social media. you wouldn't be able to go against the government and talk the way you were living in Russia. You can't do that here. You can't. You can't do that here. You've never been arrested. I've, I've had the FBI investigate me. I'm pretty sure that my house is bugged. What? what? Really? You think your house is bugged? I, just if you're yeah. all listening, oh, I have no I idea who this guy is. I have, ne- I have no idea what I'm doing here. No. I, I, well, we I, came back from a, I, I came back from a trip one time, and my dogs were locked in my bathroom door upstairs. Three dogs. Locked in the bathroom upstairs. And nobody knows why? Nobody knows why. That's interesting. Yeah. They, they forgot to let him out. Uh, <laughs> no, that, no, I'm just saying, so for me, I'd rather live in this. Look, this, 
Everybody hates the government. Everybody hates this, and I understand that, right? But when it comes down to it, throw all the people out and just throw the concept of the, company, the country in which we live in. Would you rather live in a China or would you rather live in the United States? If oh, you, there, there's no question. I'm not. I'm not okay. saying that. Like, I'm not saying that. You know, the United States. I, I still think this is the best place in the whole entire world to Correct. live. Me too. But I, I also think that the psyop that is being conveyed on people uh, makes other places a lot worse than it really is. Um, in some aspect, yes, I, I'll agree with that in some aspect. But if I had to break it down and pick which place I would live, it would always be here. It yeah. would always be the United oh, 100%, 100%, States. Hundred percent. You see what I'm saying? So I understand. You know, everything that's going on and the stuff that we're being lied to and stuff like that, 100 percent. And this is why I have the conspiracy show. But what I want to what what I'm trying to look at is I don't want to lean one way, right or left. I just want to bring the dots. I just want to bring the dots. Right. And to me, it, I'm trying to when I do this, I'm trying not to. And this is where your pe you know, some of your people I know that are the right. I'm trying to stay in the middle with the information. Now, the right can take it the way they want, grab what they want, use what they want. That's, that's critical thinking and common sense, right? That's the, the most important thing you do in school is not reading. It's reading comprehension. Do you understand what you're reading? When you learn, the most important thing is the comprehension of learning. All I want people to do is take my information and say, okay, I see what he's putting out. Now it's your job with the way you lean, right or left, to process that information and learn from it. And what I'm saying is there are dots that we are at war, and we are, the, the war that we're fighting over is semiconductors. And China is going to basically is trying to move into Africa to kick us out of the, of the, of the big customer spot and make Africa that customer. And as you see more companies from the United States running over there, they see the same thing I see, which is Dempsey and other ones. If you look, I mean, just look at what's going on right now in Niger, uh, in Niger, 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 because I had Chris Paul on the other day and he said Niger or something like that. Yeah. In, in, in Niger right now, you know, the civil war that's going on there. What, who of all people? Just went in there to try and uh, negotiate at, at the behest of the United States. Did you no, see this? No, I didn't see it. I have no idea. I've been doing this. A wild guess who tried to go into Niger and negotiate this civil war. Elon Musk. No, no. That was it's wild. A, it's a, government, it's a oh. U.S. government official. Oh, U.S. government official? Oh, God. Don't tell me it's uh, VP. No, no. Oh, thank God. It's worse. It's worse oh, than the VP. Oh, give it to me then. I don't know. Victoria Newland. That's worse. <laughs> it's so much worse. So much. I never even would have thought that, bro. I never Mrs. would have got that. Mrs. Maidon herself went in. Uh, they denied her. They wouldn't let her in. I never would. And, I never would have got that one. And then where was Prigozhin just before he got shot down, allegedly by Russia? Where was where was Prigozhin before he got shot down? I don't know. Africa. Hmm. He was in uh uh what is this uh mal middle african whatever yeah and uh molly he was in molly yeah because I, I had some remember. i had a guy on my show who basically defected from uh aretha africa because they are under chinese communism um and they shot at him running over the borders and he told me all about it that they force you to work they force you in communism i mean he'd probably come on your show your show too if you'd wanted but he literally well, ran across the border um, from there because that their leader is 100% uh, Mao. He learned from Mao um, how to run his portion of Aretha. And, and to the point that they're finding gold on the ground like it's just a ball. And they're, it's, just, it's found on the ground over there because there's a huge mine over there, and they're supposed to give it to the state. But some of them use that to, as, you know, here, take this, get me the hell out of here. Um, yeah. But I interviewed him too, um, Solomon, and I, I mean – and Rebecca would probably come on your show. She wrote Putin's playbook, and if you, if she was a, uh, and she worked as a defense intelligence agent under Trump and Flynn, and she, so she, she's big, you know, she's big Trump and she's big, you know, Flynn and stuff like that. But she worked as a defense intelligence, agent and she's from Russia, and she was used to understand Putin's mind and 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 what Putin was thinking, and he's well, not. Let me, let me read that book first, and after I read that book. Uh, Putin's play, yeah. Putin's play, reach out because she's really, <laughs> she, she's, she, it's, it's an interesting interview. She'll have a few cocktails, and uh, I, 
do that on my Friday and Saturday. Yeah, fr- and Friday and she's Friday she's too. really smart, but she was a defense intelligence agent that was heart brought on. Um, and actually, me and Will interviewed her, and um, she she breaks it down like like I said, she breaks it all down. Like some of the stuff with George Floyd was was Russia. Um, like I said, I, I'll see if I can find the other show that I did or the, the, the thing I did with the A's documentary that that was. There's a lot of disinformation that they're not our friends. They're definitely not our friends. All right. Let me. So there any more and we'll wrap up there for you because I don't, I don't know if you're people. Yeah, we're going to wrap up in just a second. There was one comment I, I saw that yeah. I really wanted to address. Oh, it was it was Big Mama T says uh, our Constitution, of the United States and the enforcement of the rules of law. I think it was Justice Scalia. In an interview, uh, it was a one-on-one interview. It was like a, a an event, and um, oh man, if I M- Big Mama T, I have your email, and, or and I, and I have you on uh, on Twitter. If I find if I can find this on YouTube, it's on YouTube still. If I can find this discussion with Scalia, I'll send it to you. But Scalia says flat out, he says, uh, "What is it that makes America great?" And the guys, you know, our Constitution. And Scalia says, "It's not our Constitution. No, it's not. R- Russia's Constitution is far better." than Mm -hmm. the United States Constitution. The Russian Federation Constitution gives you far more freedoms than our Constitution does. The difference is the enforcement of the Constitution in the United States, the respect for the Constitution in the United States. So yes, we do. I I love our Constitution. Uh, If Scalia, and I'm pretty sure it was Scalia, there's an off chance I read it in Breitbart's book, but I don't think so. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Scalia. I I wouldn't take Breitbart. Yeah, it's how we hold our Constitution still as the highest lane of the law. Right, the it, law of the land. Right, law of the, yeah, law of the land. Sorry, <laughs> um, and that is basically it. That's what keeps this country. Like I said, and this is why people are like, oh, we need to destroy. No, you don't. You don't want to rip that bad boy apart because it's not going to go back together again the way you want it to. And and to me, we need to leave it. Like I get into arguments all the time with the right to bear arms, comma, comma. And, and then it goes into the well-maintained um, militia. Well, oh, that means, you know, the right to bear arms is just for the militia. No, it's not. There's a comma there. And the definition of a comma is secondary thought. You see what I'm saying? That comma, people just drop the comma. It's like, what, what, what can you explain to me what a comma is? Yeah. Back, it, well, back then it was a period. Like, it was. Right. A period. It's stop. The right of the people right. to bear arms. Stop. We have, I have the right to bear arms. And I feel, like I said, if I can afford a tank, um, I can have a tank. It, you know what I'm saying? I, in my opinion, if I can afford a, an F-16, I should be able well, to have one. So this is going to be really interesting because of the Bruin versus New York State Pistol Association decision, basically saying that uh, the context of any law regarding the Second Amendment needs to be looked at the scope of 1776, like our founding. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, we had warships that were owned by private citizens. Correct. Like. When, when we went to war, like, private citizens handed over their... Uh, Correct. Uh, yeah, so... The Coast Guard uh, was put out there. I, I was in the United States Coast Guard. So the Coast Guard was basically established because of pirates and things like that. Private, they, they, they were allowed to have the guns. They weren't allowed to steal. <laughs> right, <laughs> You right, see what I'm exactly. saying? So they, they had cannons. That wasn't the problem. The, they were using right. the cannons to sink the ships or, or, or steal the ships with the cargo was the problem, and that's what the Coast Guard went out. So we didn't go out there to say, hey, you can't have that cannon. We went out there and said, you can't take their shit. <laughs> right. And this, this is what people don't understand. It's like you can have the guns. You can have the cannons. You can have this. Just you can't use it to steal from somebody else. And that's what the I, Coast Guard I, did. I can't wait with Brune. I can't wait till we have a, a, an ultra conservative uh, Congress and a conservative president. Because, you know, with that, man, we should be we should be ripping down all of these gun laws, man. The, this SBR crap that's going on right now, gone. Hell, even the ATF might be you might be able to abolish the ATF based on that ruling. There the was no ATF in 1776. The only Absolutely. issue I have, and maybe you can answer this, because I've gone back and forth this, this in my head, right? And people are like, about, I see you post, abolish the FBI, right? Mm-hmm. What do you do with all of the logical cases and the good cases that are handling that? Like, where do those people, like, because the FBI the does states. a lot, and let's pretend, some of the stuff they do, let's say it's not bad. To the states. How do you deal with somebody who crossed state lines then? And you 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 do, you work between in, within those states. They they can you you negotiate with each other. You don't need you don't need an FBI. 
We really don't. Well, and the, and and I'm 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 with you. I'm I'm just trying to figure out because there are some states that have different laws and different regulations, like you know, compared to other states. Like all lo- state laws well, are not the same. Right, but we need to have extradition laws. So if I commit a crime here in Florida and I go over to Georgia and commit a crime in Georgia, mm-hmm. the FBI. Why is the FBI coming after me? Because I cross state lines. Yeah, I mean, because at that point, police. At that the, point, go ahead. There should be an extradition agreement between Georgia, and there is between Georgia and Florida. Yeah, but and the police have a have to handle their own crimes and laws. So now you're now diverting police officers to handle Georgia's prison, um, not prisoners, Georgia's convicts or, com- or criminals. You're now diverting basically Tennessee to handle them if they run into Tennessee. Like for me, at, at, being ex law enforcement in the Coast Guard, it was a little different, right? Like I handled Coast Guard, but then when it came to like, if somebody was boating while intoxicated, I don't have jails, so I hand them over to the state. So a state cop would show up and then breathalyze them, and I'd give them to the state, right? But I was still there to stop them while boating under, while they were intoxicated. So if they were more than three miles out, let's say they were four miles out boating while intoxicated, I would then detain them, tow their boat back, notify the state police that they were boated while intoxicated, that hand them over to the state police, and the state police would take over as a boating while intoxicated case. So, w- if, so if this were to happen, it would be more like this. It would be more. You would have to have, and this is this is where there is a little federalization here. You would have to have a database where warrants and everything else are are uploaded for all agencies to see. It would mm-hmm. be more, uh, you know, uh, based on the person rather than you know. And say, so, say I commit a crime here in Florida. I'm over in Georgia. And uh, I get stopped by a police officer. He runs my tag and he says, hey, you've got a warrant in Florida, detains me and and so, I'm extradited back to Florida. OK, so you're but what happens if I break federal law? Like I'm breaking federal why, why, law. What, what, also. Why does the federal what, what federal laws should there be? Well, you have federal laws like racketeering and things like that, right? So racketeering can cross state lines. So if I'm racketeering, I might be racketeering. I'm doing something in this state, but I'm committing a crime through the Internet through other states. So mm-hmm. it's, those are kind of federal laws because state laws don't – some might not apply, right? The, and I, 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 I just think if we, if we kept the FBI – I've always believed to keep the FBI and let them fall under the state – let's say not the same – but the same jurisdiction as a U.S. Marshal. So a U.S. Marshal's jurisdiction isn't technically as much as investigation as doing this. So you know what I'm saying? Like a U.S. Marshal can't arrest and can't do this stuff. But when it comes to, fed, let's say, federal crimes on one level is different than state laws, state crimes, right? You broke a federal law. Uh, like interstate commerce, when trucking, is federally regulated, not so much state and state regulated. So you can break a federal regulation but not break a state regulation, and then they enforce that. So I just find it – I find it that there are unfortunately jurisdictions that the state might not be able to properly handle because now you're filling – you know, at this point, you're filling law enforcement's duties with trying to find other states. I just don't – to you, me – how do you do you could it? Make the argument, you could make the argument for what you're talking about with trade because Article 1, what is it, Section 8, I'm going off the top of my head yeah. here, does give the federal government the ability to regulate trade. Through commerce, so you, through the Department right, of commerce. commerce. You can make that argument. But what we're getting right now is we're getting an FBI that is weaponized as an intelligence agency. There's no intelligence in Oh, the I agree. FBI. I just think that how to me, we still. I, I just think if you abolish it, then you – I, I, either you implode it until – because there are special agents of the Department of Commerce, right? The Department of Commerce, technically, if you guys want to get into some of the other stuff I get into, the Department of Commerce was also used to investigate high, uh, technology and alien technology was allegedly <laughs> what they were looking for, right? Because So they were some of the people that went out and started to say, okay, you saw saucer, where did you see it? Because it was technically fell under technology. Um, so that is another part. But for me, I've always looked at the FBI and said, okay, how do you how, – uh, being law enforcement and, and – doing it it's like it's it there's a lot right there's a lot of shit you're dealing with and now you want me to start looking for other you want to know what's funny we did a back in the, when obama was um president we did a ra- we did a raid with sheriffs and customs and everybody else and it was a 48 hour basically blitz i don't i can't even remember how many illegal not legal no green cards 
or they come up to you with driver's license and, the, and they couldn't spell the word Massachusetts. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's not enough S's, bro. You're missing a couple. Next time you do a fake ID, double check your spelling. Because um, I can even spell that one. But you will not believe. And it was easy to figure out because if they had a green card, they'd come running up to you proud of it. Right? Here's my, oh, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, officer, I'm good. The ones that would ignore you and wouldn't look at you. Dude, we probably picked up a thousand in, in a small area of Gloucester, Massachusetts, illegals, illegal. And we'd call, we'd call a customs agent that we were working with, would call and be like, dude, we got a thousand. What do you want us to do? Ah, uh, just get their names and whatever address they give you and let them go. Oh, yeah. And the cust- I mean, the customs agent, look, I'm like, I, I, that's all they want? They don't want that. We don't, I don't even know if it's a real address. He's like, yeah, yeah that's fine. I well, that, I mean, that could be that could be somewhere where you divert uh, the FBI agents. There are federal agencies that we do need. Border Patrol is absolutely one of them. Yeah. Customs is another one that we need. Um, you know, ICE is another one that we need. Uh, there's a lot that we don't need. The, yeah, the like DEA, I, yeah, I don't think we need. I just uh, think we need to just merge them into into marshals and then expand the U.S. marshals jurisdiction yeah, to be able to do. Then that. you're moving them from the executive to the to the judicial branch. Well, that's, that's the only problem is they have the judicial branch isn't technically doesn't isn't able to create. You know what I mean? Would you rather have them there than the than the executive branch that creates laws? I don't. I don't know. I just don't. To me, it's tough I, because we do have to. to, to to get rid of them. And I know they're bad. I know that. But they're, are they bad or are the people, the higher ups bad telling people to do this and the lowers are just like, whatever, rather than saying, no, I ain't doing that. You know what I'm saying? It's a tough call. Yeah. It's a tough call, bro. It's tough. Anyways, yeah. sorry. Well, I, I just think that the federal government has gotten way too powerful for its britches. If our founding fathers ever saw the federal government the way it is right now, the size yeah. that it is right now, they would they would shit a brick and well, they'd that, be like... <laughs> That's why they wanted sheriffs because a sheriff was voted in. Your right. law enforcement was voted in. And, right. and so if you didn't like him or the way he's running, shit, you out, bro. Exactly. <laughs> right? That's what was the importance of the sheriff was the ability to be voted in, not be put exactly. in for power. And, and, and I don't know. I just, it's a difficult thing now because we have so many people and so many stuff. But, anyways, didn't mean to get off on a tangent. We can do another show on that. If your people, yeah, we could. We could. If it's your people discussion. want me back, how, we'll do this. If you don't want me back, put a one in the chat. If you'd ever like me back, put a two in the chat. So two, yeah, I might come back. One, don't ever come on this screen or ever go on his channel ever again. Um, uh, th- let's put a one. So if it's in fact, a, I'm unfollowing. I'm unfollowing yeah. Brian right now because you had him on here. So. Yeah, matter of no, fact, I, 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 I'm gonna file a, a suit. I'm gonna sue him for damage to personal property. My brain. Uh, put a one in the chat. No, if one if you want me to stay, and, and two if I never come back. But I, like I no, said, a lot of people, a lot of people are saying uh, they they enjoyed it. They they disagree with you on the Ukraine stuff, and that's that's, that's cool. I'm cool with that. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm cool with that. I just wanted to put what what my knowledge is of logistics and understanding of the of what's going on there, out there for somebody to process and think about. That's all. Yeah, I I, I love your story. I can't wait for your documentary. Uh, I I think I asked you this already. Any any. Uh, speculation when you're going to be finished with it? No, soon, because I'm going to start the party now. Um, usually some of this is referenced, because this is good here, because I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm recording this for myself, so I can go back and, and answer some of the questions that, that people have been putting in, in also to make sure that I hit those if I can. Um, if I don't have the answers or I haven't been down that path yet, then I just won't. But like I said, this is just you're, a... So, so you're recording this, so I just want to make sure I get this in here. Uh, a shit balls... Mm-hmm. sweaty underwear mm-hmm. uh dirty butts yeah. i want to get all that in there so you can you yeah. can put it in your documentary yeah nsa did you hear that nsa did you hear what he just said uh i mean uh yeah that's pretty much no, either way like i said so i do have um if you want to put my page in the link and i'm on youtube now uh, some of the other stuff i do is i have uh, if anybody ever watched coast to coast am i we, i talk aliens and bigfoots and stuff like that too because i enjoy talk, talking that stuff but the rabbit hole conspiracy stuff is what I really enjoy doing. And I, and I want to put, like I said, connecting those dots is what I'm also doing with the channel, too. So, Yeah, so, so tell everybody, where, where can they find you? On, I'm on, on YouTube, YouTube um, under at Sage Outcast. Um, it's got a little monkey there. I'm also on Subspace Odyssey Radio. Um, and that's on Saturday nights where we put a show and I have a co-host and we do stuff like uh, Skinwalker and Secret Space Program and things like that. Uh, we also talk stuff like fringe science, fringe theory, and fringe science, like quantum mechanics and things like that. 
um, in regards to I believe we live in a simulation, which that that might drive people insane. Um, but it, it, that's basically created as as we go, to be honest. And that that'd be a whole other show if you ever want to debate. I'll, I can debate that one with you. Yeah, I'll actually put uh, the link to uh, I'll put the link to your. Uh, yeah, I YouTube don't think I can because I'm not like a moderator. I don't know how Rumble works. I'm trying to move over. I do have a Rumble. I am on Rumble under Sage Outcast also. Um, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna start moving over to Rumble because yes, yes, George Nooney's Coast to Coast AM. Absolutely. I I used to drive truck and listen to that, um, and now I do a channel because I'm like, man, I love that. It was a great time just talking about that stuff and having fun with it and stuff. But the rabbit hole stuff I'm serious about. Like I, I, I make sure I connect the dots properly with that. Mm. And uh, just my final thought, I just saw somebody say, if nothing is real, then nothing matters. Uh, there is a potential at the rate we're developing artificial intelligence right now that we already developed it. Another great Rick and Morty episode for you, dude. Have you seen the Google Franks? No. No, so I Google Franks, Rick is Rick is flying his car, his his spaceship car, and all of a sudden it, he, he's getting ready to leave and the, the car won't start. And he's like, oh, it's my battery. So he goes out there and he looks at his battery and he opens the car up and he's like, all right, get ready, Morty. We're going in. And he says, going in where? Into the battery. And so he goes into the battery and he created a world inside of his battery that is like just a normal world, like like we are here, but everybody has to pedal for like a certain number of hours a day and they create energy to keep their world going and they think that it's to keep their world going and all of that excess energy is redirected to a volcano in their world and that's what powers the car and so while rick goes down there he's like why is my car or no he doesn't say why is my car not running he says mm. why are you guys not doing the google frank anymore and he says oh you're never going to believe this but our top scientists created a, a microverse and we're able to use them to make our power. And he's like, oh, great. And so they go into the, that microverse. And then they go into another microverse. And they end up getting trapped down there. But that, that's my, my concept here. Like, we could be in a simulation. and uh, when we, we are. You know, 100% a little... in a simulation. We are 100%. I can prove it. You want to do a show? You can prove it. I, I, think, I think I can prove it. I think I can. I, I, well, one, I'll give you one, just one. And if you want to do a show on this, I'll give you a whole bunch of other. I love nothing more than to do a All show right. on this. So I'll just give you one. So right now, you know of the um, quantum slit experiment? No. Okay, so the, not quantum. It's just a, it, just a particle split experiment. So if you okay, were to yes, take a that. particle, you take two slits and a piece of paper, and you tape one. And you fire particles through the slit, it makes it into another piece of paper. It makes a direct line. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a show on this. If you want to watch the video, I have a video. Let's, um, let me send me the video. Okay. Send me the video and I'll get you on and we'll do another. But if, we, if you open the other one, it goes through sporadically. If you don't look at it, it goes through sporadically. Bro, I'm still, I'm still blown away that you can put a, uh, uh, you can put a, what the hell was it? My wife and I did this one day. You put like a a, a piece of uh, cardboard or something up against a mirror, so that you know you're yeah. you're not in line with the mirror, and you put your hand here, and somehow your hand shows up on the mirror, even though it's complete. It's it's fucking wild. I'm telling I, anyways, you, I'm just telling you that basically it, it's it, uh, and it gets to the point that until you dis until you see the answer, it the answer doesn't exist. You know that, right? Mm. Like until. In, in a quantum level, until you actually take a look and see which slit it came through, it doesn't exist. Per, uh, what's in my hand? Nothing. No, no. Uh, what's, what, there's something in there, let's say. What's in it? Air. All kinds of things. What is the potential of could be in my hand? <laughs> anything that will fit, right? Yeah. Absolutely anything that will fit. I could have a, a, a key. I could have a paper clip. I could have absolutely anything. The potential is unlimited as long as it fits in my hand. But until I open my hand and show you I have a, mem I have a USB, now you can't take it back. Even if I close my hand, you know th the answer's there. And that's the same way it works on a quantum level. Absolutely anything can happen until you see it, and then it happened exactly the way you saw it happen. Uh, dude, I'll do a whole show with videos on this. A whole. All right, I'm down. I, if you check on there, it says, "Are we living in a simulation?" Go to my go to my page. I don't have that many videos on there because I I ripped all my other videos down and I started over. So I've got like twenty. I'm starting to grow again because all my other videos 
um, people, you know, or interviews and stuff like that, and I'm having more fun doing this. It says, are we living in a simulation? And just watch it on high speed. And I break it down to basically say, we are. The reason we can't go faster than the speed of light is because that's the simulation speed in which things happen. And the reason it starts to slow down as you start to catch up is you're getting faster than the simulation. And the simulation won't let you pass. Right? That's interesting. But the simulation itself actually travels faster. That's what the quantum entanglement is. Quantum entanglement can actually transfer information between the two particles faster than the speed of light. Because outside of the simulation, something has to be faster. Perfect example. If you were to do a Pac-Man board, a Pac-Man board to a... To, you know, two things can't be in the same spot. Sure they can. If you created a Pac-Man board as a... Um, software developer, it's one zero one zero one zero one zero, right? It's a bunch of ones and zeros. And I have a picture of it. I could show you a Pac-Man board and a bunch of ones and zeros. It's, it, it's the exact same thing. Just different perceptives. Just different perceptives. Now, a software programmer could say, that's a Pac-Man board. Right. And he could say, that's a Pac-Man board, because that's, he's designed it. But it's different possessions of two exact things existing in the exact same place. That's, that literally is what that is. So I can give you, I can give you if you look at the double, um, the double quantum experiment, where they, oh, dude, I'll do a show on it, and, and I'll break it all down, that they literally, time doesn't exist. Time, uh, it doesn't, like, it, once it goes through the system, it will a actually change back in time. So See, if you, is, I'm telling you, like, the quantum, the paradox in regards to um, if you kill your grandfather, or if you kill back and kill your grandfather, you'll never exist. That paradox has been broken because they've established that once you exist, you exist. It doesn't matter. Right. Once you're there, you're there. That kid, so uh, you'd have to, the person would have to kill them before you were born. Because once you exist in the simulation, you exist. I believe ghosts are just people that are glitching in the simulation and starting over. Interesting. I've heard, uh, Okay, same, listen I've heard. to me. Listen right, to so me. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We got we to wrap this up. We're going Dude, to I, I got personal hours. experience with this with me and my wife. Me and my wife, it, it, there are things that we did. I joined, the, uh, look, man, I was never in the military. I was a union truck driver making fantastic money at U.S. Food Service, married with a child, living in a house, my first house, I just, uh, uh, I just put together an all-star hockey team that won um, an, uh, basically a state-level championship. I was the coach. I had everything going for me. For some odd reason of my own accordance, I joined, nobody in my family was in the military. Nobody, I, I'm from Buffalo, New York. I have no idea what the Coast Guard is. I've never been on a boat. I joined the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard brings me to Boston. My wife comes from money. <laughs> she marries, at 17, she marries a 38-year-old loser, drunk, that she should have never married and never got together with. I mean, literally, he, well, he was, yeah, he was, no, he was like 32 at the time. Loser. That she would have never, I mean, she, my, I can tell you stuff off screen about my wife with the money that she had with her family. She ends up in Boston where we get together. There is no reason that I should have been in the Coast Guard in Boston. <laughs> There's no reason. But for some reason, I believe the simulation puts you back together with the people that you're supposed to be with. And there are things that I did, and there's a bunch of other things that I'm like, There's what? how in the hell did I end up in Boston? Now, unfortunately, we happened to have an affair, and got, I got in a bunch of trouble like that, but we've been married for 20 years, and we've been together 365, 24-7 for 18 of those 20 years. So the, think about that. And, the, and, and I lost custody of my child because I couldn't afford to pay this, and I couldn't do this, and yes, you know, stuff like that. But the decisions that I made were the... My, even my family was like, what the hell is the Coast Guard? I'm like, actually, I don't really know. But it, I'm going to do law enforcement... I, I went down there at 28. I was, they were like, dude, you're like one year away from not being able to join the Coast Guard. I went in, left a union truck driving job, and went in the Coast Guard and had 18-year-olds telling me what to do. 
I'm like, oh, this is fantastic. Um, I, had to, I had to make rank. I finally made rank where I could start telling people what to do. But either way, it was like, I, I'm from Buffalo, New York. I've never been in the Coast Guard, never even seen the Coast Guard. They had no idea what they did. Just went down there and be like, I want to join the Coast Guard. Where do you want to go, Boston? Why? I don't know. I have no idea. Wow. I had no idea. That's a wild. And, uh, All right. Um, r- real quick, just one thing I wanted to see. I saw Denise Ann said, I'm a Christian, so I don't buy us living in a simulation. They're not. It, that doesn't like the fact that I think we're living in a sol- simulation doesn't change anything about uh, God and Absolutely religion. Uh, I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of different types of. Well, let me ask you. Uh, is would, Let me ask that person. Would ha- if you could go back to live and see the people again that you've just left when you pass, would that not be heaven? To be able to go back and do the simulation all over, if I could go, knowingly go back and know that if I live this life out and, and I pass, that I'm going to go back and see my wife again and live through this simulation again, I'd do it every day of the week. And if that's not heaven, to, that's heaven to me. Being able to go well, through it- this again with my wife is heaven to me. Well, right, exactly, and and the 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 idea of living in a in a simulation. I mean, you still have a creator. Somebody Correct. had to create this. If we're Correct. in a simulation, somebody created this. Maybe our perception of a creator has gotten uh, construed or misconstrued or or changed in some form or fashion. Or or maybe we're just a digital uh, creation of our own. Uh, actual body that's very much like the matrix, and we unplug, Correct. and we're in a different society, and you know, God still, our our organic biological body is in is in another uh, dimension, so Absolutely. to speak. It's, and this yeah, is it's, it's crazy, dude. dude just is, because, just, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, just because you know you think this is a simulation, that doesn't mean that religion's not uh, impactful and that you Absolutely. know it's denouncing. Absolutely. Yeah. And and like, time. everything that, like I said, if you lived in a simulation and restarted, everything that says you're going to see your grandparents again, you're going to see this, it's going to be better. And maybe if you're put in the simulation, you might be able to get to choose. Do you want to go back to the same one or do you want a new one? But to me, heaven would be going back to this. It'd be going back to the same one to meet my wife. Yep. Right. That's my choice. And so for me, like I said, dude, this is the fringe stuff we talk about on my show. This is what I want to the stuff I want to talk about or the stuff I talk about. I don't do a lot of lives yet. Uh, but I, like I said, I'd like to go to go to Rumble because YouTube's pissing me off. Um, go to Rumble. Start building it now. I'm telling you right now. Start building it. Well, now. put my Rumble you show on there game. then. Put my Rumble show on here. All right, I will. I'll, I'll get put it in the private chat. But uh, uh, yeah. we got to wrap this up. So uh, Sage, we'll we'll have you back again. We'll do we'll do a, a fun discussion where we talk. Yeah, about just all pick this a topic. Uh, or like I said, if you got a bunch of people on and you need somebody to to, to basically piss people off with their comments, I, I could do that. Somebody in the chat said, uh, "CanCon's not normally. CanCon's usually the normie. Uh, they must watch me on Badlands because I do mainly news shows over on Badlands, and I try and stay uh, in the norm when I do news shows because I'm, you know, we're trying to compete. Uh, I have all sorts of crazy conspiracies and uh, stuff like that. that well, I talk bring me. About. I mean, if that's what you want to do, I, the problem is I can't do nights. Is, is right. I can't do nights with my wife because she has claustrophobic and, and panic attacks and stuff. And so when it starts to get dark, she starts to, to get nervous. So, but if you ever want to do like, uh, why not a Saturday morning show? I well, can. Well, uh, Saturday mornings are rough because my wife usually she works till four in the morning the night before, so she sleeps in and my studio is right next door to her, uh, our bedroom. So, all right. Well, what I uh, can probably do like. I can probably do like uh, every other Sunday night when she has to work. Um, Sunday afternoon, you mean? Oh yeah, fuck, that's right. Um, so you can only go on when she works? No, no, no. I can do it during oh. the days, but dude, between our schedules, man, my wife and I see each other. Like we we have a joke that we high five in the hallways because um, oh, really? we it used to be like that way because we never saw each other. She worked at night mainly, and I worked during the day and. Now I'm home all the time, so we see each other a lot more. But when we do see each other, yeah. I try and make sure that I'm, you know, dedicated to her and not everything else going on. And even then, uh, you know, I still got to <laughs> I still got to make sure that uh, I'm not behind a computer for you know, the entire day like I am today. But I, I'm working on a big story. So, yeah, I do I, have to I, that stage, though. So uh, we'll, we'll link up, brother. And uh, as soon as your your documentary is done, let me know and I'll get that. I'll get that pumped out as well all right cool thanks for having me on thanks everybody for like i said i don't mind it being challenged in any way shape or form like i said if you're i'll go respectively you know back and forth with anybody and i don't you don't have to believe me in anything and and if you doubt me if you just say show me i'll show you what i got but i i, I like the people that say basically i don't believe them that's perfect 
that makes me just work harder. I'm cool with that. That's, that's the good discussion. So. All right, brother. Take care, man. God All bless. Right. See you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to wrap this show up. Uh, it just it blows my mind, uh, you know, putting everything together in a, in a way like that, you know, being able to look at it from a, a different perspective like that. It's, it's pretty scary, man. <laughs> I